We are live. Welcome everyone to the debate, the debate, uh, the debate you all have been waiting for. Scripture unraveled, a biblical polygyny debate. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. Thank all you guys for being here. Pastors, uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules. I know ministering to a flock is uh, a, more than a full-time job. So thank you for taking the time out to do this. Very excited to have you guys here. Um, do me a favor, everyone drop a comment. Let us know that you're here, that you're watching. Say hello. Uh, we're going to have a section for Q&A and not uh, towards the end of the debate. I'll go over the parameters shortly of, of how this is going to work, but please drop a comment. Let us know that you can see us and hear us okay. This is the first time we've had this many people, or at least I have, on a stream at the same time. So I just want to make sure that y'all can see us and hear us good, well. Feel free to share this. Uh, we'd love for more people to see this. So uh, you know, please hit that share button. And again, if you have any questions, comments, yeah, buts, what about any of that, drop them in the comments. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, again, we're going to have a section for Q&A towards the end. Uh, but before we get started, let me go ahead and just give you guys a little bit of background information before I introduced uh, my my guests. And I just kind of want to tell everybody why we're doing this. I, I personally uh, have disco discovered this information about biblical polygyny about three to four months ago and um, found it to be very eye-opening um, and have just been learning a lot ever since, been posting a lot about it, kind of stirred up a lot of controversy. Uh, people, it's a very polarizing topic and um, really thought, you know, I want to I want to do a debate where I get some really smart people on either side of the aisle to come in and talk about this, people that are smarter than me uh, to talk about, which isn't that hard to do, actually. <laughs> but uh, some guys that, to talk about this and to, you know, see if we can get to the bottom of it. So was blessed to have pastors J.D. Martin and Mike Holloway, who I'll tell you about in a second, reach out and, and agree to come on here and, and, and do this debate, along with uh, a new friend of mine, Pete Rambo, and uh, Bible Marriages. So let me go ahead and tell you who these guys are now. Uh, Pastor J.D. Martin, he is, uh, on, well, let me start off by saying, on the opposing side of polygyny, we have Pastor J.D. Martin. He has a Master's of Divinity from Southern Seminary, He's got a Bachelor of Religion for, from Liberty University. He's the host of the YouTube channel, Exploring Theology, and he's the husband of one wife of 13 years and a father of six children. Congratulations on that. Uh, let everyone know where they can find you, uh, Pastor J.D. Yeah, um, Exploring Theology uh, YouTube channel. So you just put in Exploring Theology, and then you can put J.D. Martin as well, and you'll find it. And I uh, do a whole bunch of different theological topics, That's hence Exploring Theology uh, via, via YouTube, also on my Facebook, you can look up JD Martin and just a variety of uh, different content that I try to put out there for people. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and then next we have pastor Mike Holloway and he is the lead pastor of walking on water Bible church in Livonia. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Michigan. He is also Christian. He's a, also a Christian apolog apologist and defender of the Christian faith. He's the husband of one wife for 20, for 29 years. Very impressive with three sons. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, let everyone know where they can find you too, Pastor Mike. Uh, thank you. Grace and peace, everyone. Uh, I am, again, Pastor Mike. I can be found on YouTube at Elder Mike, Your Urban Church. Again, that's Elder Mike, Your Urban Church. You can also follow me on Facebook just at Michael uh, Holloway. So Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Mike. All right. Now on the side, arguing on behalf of biblical polygyny, we have Pete Rambo. And Pete has a Master's of Divinity also from Columbia Bible College. He's been in ministry for 25 years. He's pastored a church for 10 of those. He currently is the husband of two wives, and he's the author of Authority, Headship, and Family Structure. He has a Patreon channel for people who are learning headship and patriarchy and, are, and for those who are interested in learning more about biblical polygyny. Uh, I want to go ahead and post the link to uh, Pete's patreon for anyone that may want to connect with him but go ahead and tell everyone where they can find you pete oh, oh wait we can't hear you pete Oops. so i also have a youtube channel it is uh, peter g rambo and uh, that's where i host parlay with pete uh, do interviews have a lot of different discussions particularly focusing on headship and family structure 
Mm -hmm. um, also have a blog, Natsav, N-A-T-S-A-B dot com with lots and lots of resources in the biblical marriages section and have authored a couple books. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Last but not least, we have on Bible marriages and uh, Bible marriages is remaining anonymous because, and he, we're not even going to necessarily share his credentials because like Berean Patriot, who some of you seen the podcast I've had with him, he wants you to not know what his credentials are because he doesn't want you to rely on his knowledge. He wants you to, he's going to state some facts and he wants you to go back and research them for, for themselves, for, for yourselves. Also with cancel culture and other things, um, he's just choosing not to show his face in this, in this debate. Maybe, maybe he will in the future, but for anyone that was thinking that Bible marriages was me, <laughs> cause there were several people accusing me of being Bible marriages. You're going to find out very quickly that it was not me. So, um, Welcome to the debate. Uh, let everyone know where they can find you, Bible Marriages. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, you can just find me on Instagram, on, on Twitter, and on Facebook, just at Bible Marriages. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Uh, so before we get started, I just want to kind of establish the, the debate format and rules, let everybody know how this is going to work. Uh, each side will be given up to 20 minutes for an opening statement, and then each side will be given 45 minutes to cross-examine the other side. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody knows this is going to be a positive uh, debate, very positive tone. We all prayed together before we came on live. We are no, we're not adversaries. We're all playing for the same team, but we're just uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of God's truth as it relates to this subject. So um, before we get started, I wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page about two things. Uh, first is that we want to make sure that we all define sin in the same way, because I think that's going to come up. I, in fact, I know it's going to come up and that sin is transgression of the law as it, uh, what was the verse, the the, the passage that says transgression without law, there is no sin. When you all know that was it first John three. OK, that's it. Three, five, I think. Yeah. So is that how we all define sin? No, yes. I, mean, I think that's fine. Transgression okay. of God's law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. And then we all believe that that all scripture is God breathed and it's basically inerrant. Absolutely. I would say completely like, inerrant, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I would also say not basically, completely. Yes, I would agree. Okay, completely inerrant. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so what I thought was uh, would be nice and fair is we would go ahead and flip a coin. Um, <clears throat> I have a little online coin flipper here, and we're going to get to see which side gets to go first. So here we go. Uh, Pastor... Mike Holloway, why don't you go ahead and call it? I'll hit the flip button. Sure. Go ahead. Pedro Tails. Tails. Heads. Okay. So uh, Pete and Bible marriages, would you like to go first or would you like them to go first? Uh, my preference would be to go oh. second. Yeah, good. Sorry. Or, or, wait. Okay. Was okay, that you're, you're good. I For a second, I didn't think, I thought I did, maybe didn't share the screen. So we, we did see the coin flip. Okay. So yeah, it was heads. Did you want the, did you want to go first or would you like them to go first? Uh, I'd like them to go first. We, we we will go second. Okay, great. So Pastor JD and Mike, go ahead and take it away. You have 20 minutes. I'm just gonna hit my timer. All right, just give me one second. Let me set my timer. Sure. All right, here we go. Um, so our 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 position is the standard Christian position has been the standard Christian position for essentially two thousand uh, years now. We're talking uh, whether you're Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, Reformed. Everybody pretty much on in the Christian consensus agrees essentially with the position we're holding, which is that God's best and God's will is monogamy. And on the flip side, polygamy is not God's best. It's not God's will. And then I would even go, and I think Michael Holloway agrees with me this. I would go even further and say that it is a sin and it's a violation of uh, the law of love. It's just a violation of God's law and Christians ought not to do that. Um, the first thing I would say is when we think about marriage, we really need to recognize that it's not my opinion. I don't get to define marriage. The government doesn't get to define marriage. Nobody ultimately gets to define marriage except God. God is the one who created marriage and instituted it for man's good. And where did God uh, do that? Where did God create marriage? Well, we see that right in the very beginning of the pages of the Bible. God created man. He created woman. He said it's not good for man to be alone. 
and that he brought the two together in order to create marriage. And then right there in that Genesis passage, it tells us that for this reason, right when he creates Adam, he creates Eve, he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh. That's establishing marriage. God is the one who defined marriage. And I think it's really important to recognize that when God initially created marriage in an unfallen uh, sinless state, and this is his ideal for marriage, what did he do? Did he create Adam and Steve? Did he create Adam and the animals and they were supposed to do some kind of weird bestiality thing? Did he create Adam and 16 women, one woman, two women, three women? What did God do? And we see very clearly that God created Adam and Eve, and this was marriage as it was supposed to be. Now, it doesn't take you very long to go through the book of Genesis to realize that God's ideal has been destroyed and corrupted and twisted by men. So God never designed for men to kill each other. And right there in the first few pages, you have Cain killing uh, Abel. And you, God's ideal was never for man to follow Satan. But right there in the beginning, you have Adam and Eve following Satan over God. So from the very beginning, man starts to corrupt this and God's perfect world and his perfect law no longer is being fulfilled. And now we live in a sin fallen world. And in that, you don't go very far until you see the first case of polygamy, which is from Lamech, a godless man from the godless line of Cain. So where does monogamy come from? It comes from God's idea and God's creation. It comes right there in the garden. Where does polygamy come from? Polygamy comes from the evil line of Cain, where a man who is a essentially a mass murderer at that time, who's bragging about killing people, goes and breaks God's ideal, not only to not shed human blood, but also to take on additional wives. And then we really don't see polygamy beyond that until we finally get to the patriarchal period, where all of a sudden you have the, the cases of um, Abraham and Hagar, and we all know how that went. Uh, this certainly was a sinful reality. He shouldn't have done that. It, it, it led to utter disaster. And really, if you trace the entire Bible from that point, you continue to see polygamy just produce disaster, death, uh, sin. It's it's all bad, right? From Ultimately, from a uh, bad root comes bad fruit. And so if you look at polygamy throughout the Bible, it starts from a bad root, <clears throat> the evil line of Cain, and then all it produces is heartbreak, pain, envy, bad parents, uh, sibling rivalry, death, destruction, lust. It's all bad. It is all evil. Now, moving over into the New Testament, what we see is in the book of Matthew, when Jesus is dealing with the question of divorce, people are saying, well, can we just divorce our wives for anything? And Jesus says, Okay, well, let's go back and determine, have you not read how God did it in the beginning? So when Jesus is answering the question about divorce, he doesn't go back to Moses. He goes all the way back to creation and says, have you not read what God did in the beginning? He says he made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, shall father, um, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is marriage. He says, whatever God has joined, let no man separate. Then they ask him, well, what about Moses' law? Moses uh, regulates divorce, so therefore it must be okay in God's mind. We can just divorce for any reason. And he says to them, Moses did this because of the hardness of your hearts. Because of the hardness of your hearts, he permitted this. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, and then he goes and then goes back to original creation. It says, this is the standard. Whoever divorces except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So Jesus tells us here that just because you find something in the book of Moses or just because you find an example among the patriarchs does not mean it's a good example. It does not mean that it is God's ideal. People twisted that. They thought, well, because Moses permitted divorce, that must be God's ideal. It must be okay to do that. And Jesus says, no, it isn't. Ultimately, what's right is what we see in creation and what I tell you and what he tells us is that he created male and females, one union, one flesh. Now, it's also very important to see what Jesus says here. He says right here, right here, Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, look it up. He says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for in the case of sexual immorality, so he doesn't do a biblical divorce, God says you're still married, okay? And he says, if that person then marries another, this is not hooking up with another, this is marrying another, this is polygamy right here. He commits adultery, and whoever divorces, whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. I want you to see this. So if you improperly divorce your wife, God says you're still married. So even if you put on another wife and marry her, God says, no, this is invalid. This marriage is invalid, and you are, in fact, committing adultery. So the, the people that we're debating, ultimately, if uh, one of them at least says that he has two wives, 
the position from the Bible is, no, actually he has one wife and he's committing adultery on the other wife. That's what the Bible says. So if this is true, then of course polygamy is not biblical. It's not acceptable. It shouldn't be done. I think Matthew 19, uh, in, in, in contrasting that with Genesis 2, makes it utterly clear polygamy is sinful. Polygamy is adultery. All right, the second argument would be in Ephesians chapter 5, it tells us that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Christ gave himself for the church and that husbands are to love their wives, right? Now, here's the question. How can you love your wife while you then look at other women, try to court other women, mm -hmm. then successfully get other women to agree with you to be your supposed husband and then sleep with other women. How is that loving your wife? I, I really, uh, when we get to the cross, that's our axiom. How is this man who says that he's a Christian, who says that he loves his wife, he says he's been married for 30 years, but it doesn't matter. You've been married for a day. Please tell me how you can claim to love your wife as you're sleeping with another woman. That doesn't sound loving at all to me. It's a violation of the law of love. Another reality about the law of love is you're supposed to treat others like you would like to be treated. Isn't that the golden rule? Treat others like you would like to be treated. Here's my question for any polygamist. Do you want your wife sleeping with another man, whether they claim to be married or not? Is, is that the law of love? Is that what a loving heart wants to be treated that way? Do you want your daughters to be treated that way? Do you want your daughters to be sharing a man with multiple women? Is, is that the law of love? I think that's absolutely not the law of love. I don't think anybody wants that for themselves. And I certainly don't think anybody wants that for their daughter. And if you do, I think there's something wrong with you uh, because that is obviously not right. All right. The third argument. In the Bible, we see that there are stipulations for elders. Elders have certain stipulations of what they're supposed to be. And the, the basic uh, framework of this is they're supposed to be blameless. They're supposed to be people that people can say, that is what a godly man looks like. Now, in those stipulations, we have things like he's supposed to be sober-minded. He's supposed to have good behavior. He's supposed to be hospitable. He's supposed to be not a drunkard. He's supposed to be non-pugnacious. He's supposed to be a good father, a good leader, all these things, right? Every Christian man should be able to look at the elder and say, that's the kind of man that a, a godly man should look like. Well, the elders also said he's to be a husband of one wife. Now, if polygamy is not adultery, if polygamy is not sinful, if polygamy is okay, if it's even worse, God's ideal, then why in the world would God forbid his elders, his model Christians, from being polygamous. It doesn't make any sense. It simply doesn't. The logic only makes sense if, in fact, this is an evil institution that is not God's ideal. And so anyone who's participating in this is barred from Christian eldership. As the same thing is also true for the deacon. The deacon also is to be a husband of one wife. Now, there's no way that you could be a husband of one wife and also be involved in polygamy. It is not the case. So I think from uh, those three arguments, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike, I'm going to make one more argument, number four, and then and you take it away. So those three arguments, I would say destroy polygamy. It is not biblical. It is not loving. It is not God's ideal. It is sinful. It is adultery. You cannot be an elder because you're not a role model, and no one should look up to someone who is uh, committing uh, perpetual adultery on their wife. Last argument, argument number four, is in 1 Corinthians 7, it says that the husband's body belongs to the wife and the wife's body belongs to the husband, okay? So your body belongs to your spouse, whether male or female. This was absolutely shocking in the Greco-Roman world, which thought that women were simply just property and sex organs that you could just have your pleasure and you just wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and just leave them on the side. No, God says that's not true at all. That you're supposed to be loving each other. And just as she has sexual needs, you need to satisfy that. And you have sexual needs and she needs to satisfy you. So again, note this, that the woman's body belongs to the husband and the husband's body belongs to the wife. Now, once again, what woman out there that you haven't manipulated, twisted, and, and beat them down spiritually, spiritual abuse essentially, would allow her husband to go and sleep with another woman? Nobody. This is a violation of 1 Corinthians 7. If your body belongs to your wife, go ask your wife, do you want me doing this? And 99% of the time, she's going to say no because she knows God's law. She knows this is not right. It is not, uh, it is not good. So that's a, a fourth argument. So Mike, you want to take it away? 
First sure. off, yeah, let me give you props, man. That was really good. Everybody drop some uh, thumbs up hearts for Pastor JD. I, I want you all to know we got the best. We weren't scared of, of finding people that were intelligent because I didn't want anybody to think I stacked the deck. So that was that was very well done. Thanks, Pastor uh, JD. Everybody, real quick, before Pastor Mike comes in, please leave a comment. Let us know that you're here. Look, we have about 150 people watching right now. Um, subscribe to the channels and uh, feel free to share this. This is important info that we'd like to see get out. All right. Take it away, Pastor Mike. Yes, sir. Can you give me my time check before I start? Sure. You got about eight and a half minutes. Eight and a half minutes. Thank you. Uh, and awesome job, Pastor JD. Uh, again, the, this debate boils down to whether we're going to believe what God established or are we going to yield ourselves over to what mankind has done. The origin account, as Pastor JD so eloquently brought out, is clear. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a singular woman. And singular is my uh, uh, emphasis. And he brought her to the man. As Pastor J.D. stated, the first show of multiple wives stems from the wicked line of Cain. Afterwards, throughout the biblical history, we see described in scripture several instances of men taking multiple wives, even uh, righteous men, men we would call righteous, such as Abraham, uh, Jacob, David and Solomon. It is clear in the same way, however, that God permitted Moses to allow divorce because of the hardness of men's heart. In the same way, he permitted men within the Old Testament culture to have multiple wives. But let us not make the mistake of assuming what is described in the text should be what is prescribed for our lives. As a matter of fact, we see the opposite that even God commanded kings in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, where he says, neither shall he multiply wives for himself. Why? Lest his heart be turned away. Genesis again, in the beginning, God says that a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Again, and all these words, and even in the context of the language, they're singular uh, words, and they shall become one flesh, not one flesh here, one flesh there. And this verse is often cited to emphasize the concept of a man and a woman coming together as one, highlighting the unity and exclusivity of the marital partnership. However, let us take a step back and begin to view marriage as it is depicted in scripture according to God's divine intention. Biblical marriage in scripture is shown as a parallel between Christ and his bride, the church. And the union of marriage serves as a powerful illustration of the ideal relationship between a husband and a wife. The analogy of marriage is often seen as a type that prefigures or foreshadows a New Testament reality. Pastor J.D. already quoted from Ephesians chapter number five, verse 25, where it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her not them, but her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she singular, my emphasis might be holy and without blemish. The imagery of Christ presenting the church as a radiant and holy bride, emphasizing the sanctifying and purifying nature of this monogamous relationship between Christ and his church and Christ doesn't have two churches. He doesn't have three or four churches. He has one church made up of both Jew and Gentile. The Old Testament continues to communicate this reality in several places. In Hosea chapter number two, God says concerning Israel, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in what? faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. The idea of God betrothing Israel to himself, emphasizing the enduring nature of their monogamous relationship. We can search throughout scripture and we'll find God saying to you, Israel, only <clears throat> above all other nations. Why? Israel, again, the community of faith, the community of uh, those that are in covenant with God, God elevates. There's a special love that God has for his bride above all all others as a man should have above 
uh, uh, all other women when it comes to the love that is shared for his wife. In Isaiah chapter number 54, verse 5, God says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, the God of the whole earth. He is called. Here, Isaiah portrays God as the husband of Israel. The husband of Israel, not the husband of the Egyptians, not the husband of the Philistines, not the husband of other nations, but the husband of Israel. And we find that in order to be in this covenant, even other nations could be included, but they had to conform and be uh, di uh, discipled within the covenant community of God's one bride his covenant community, his people. In Jeremiah chapter number 31, God promises to make a covenant with us through faith, right? He says, not like the covenant I made with your fathers when I brought them out of the uh, uh, out of Egypt, that covenant which they break. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. God was faithful to Israel above all the other nations. In my conclusion, as I bring this uh, on in, the biblical narrative consistently uses the imagery of marriage to describe the relationship between God and his people. In the New Testament, this imagery is elevated to a new level with Christ being the bridegroom and the church as his bride. This typology underscores the depth of the covenant commitment, sacrificial love, and the ultimate unity intended in the marriage relationship. Just as Christ loves and sanctifies his singular church, husbands are called to love and cherish their wife, creating a profound and transformative connection that reflects the divine relationship between Christ and his church. Not multiple <laughs> churches, but Christ is faithful to his church. Whew. Wow. That was good. Y'all came prepared. <laughs> Very good, Pastor Mike. Bless Impressive. You. All right. Uh, Pete, you're going to do the opening statements for your side. Pete Rambo. Roger that. Fantastic. Okay. It's good to be here. Gentlemen, it's going to be a fun conversation. I can tell that already, and I'm excited about this. So I am going to share screen. I've got a little slide presentation. I am chomping at the bit to answer some of the things that you said, but we've got to make the case first, and that's where we are going to go. Uh, first thing we need to do is make the case. So the big question here is, all right, uh, great. The big question here is, is polygyny sin? The question is, is it sin? And we've already defined that sin is the transgression of the law. Now, you gentlemen have been using the word polygamy, and what you need to understand is that there, that polygamy is actually an umbrella term Polygyny is only one spoke of the umbrella. Certainly polyamory and polyandry are much in the, uh, in, in the media these days. Polyamory from polyamor, which means many loves, and that typically is a mix of men and women, and it's a violation of, Le of Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, that says that a woman is not to have relations with a man other than her husband. It is adultery. And in that verse, we find the definition of adultery. The definition of adultery is a married woman having relations with a man other than her husband. It's the only place that it's ever defined for us in Scripture. Polyandry is many husbands. And we recognize, again, that would be a woman with more than one man, which is a violation of Scripture. However, polygyny, polygune, having more than or multiple women, a man with more than one wife is never condemned in scripture. And so we are going to talk about this a little bit. Facts that we need to lay out at first, nowhere in scripture is polygyny ever called a sin. Nowhere is there a single case where God shows displeasure with any of his servants for having more than one wife. Nowhere is polygyny ever judged. You will not find it. It is not there. There's not a single place in scripture anywhere where God does that. There, And we know that where there is no law, there is no sin. What do we find in scripture when we actually take the time to study this out instead of assuming that the party line that we've been fed for the last several hundred years is uh, when, when we take the time to question that, because I grew up, I came up with exactly what you two gentlemen just said, and then I did the study. I did the homework, and I found out a whole bunch of different things. 
What we do find is that God regulates polygyny. We find that he causes polygyny. We find that he commands polygyny. There are times that he blesses polygyny. He approves polygyny and he practices polygyny. So let's take a look at the case. Foundational truths, God does not change. He does not have unequal weights and measures. We see at, at least six places in scripture, he calls that an abomination. His law has been established from the beginning and it is the same. It remains the same today. Uh, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Yeshua, Jesus, says exactly the same thing. We're told in Hebrews that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32, right before chapter the very important chapter 13, tells us that you shall not add to nor take away from this book of the law. Yeshua Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19 said, I did not come to abolish the law. And he does say in, in verse 19, he says that if you want to be least in the kingdom, the way to do that is to annul and teach to annul even the least commandments. So if you want to sign up to be least in the kingdom, that's how you do it. OK, but to be great in the kingdom, keep and teach the commandments. So let's take a look at the details. These six statements that I make. God regulates polygyny. A regulator typically goes on top of a high pressure tank, and it's there for the purpose of making sure that uh, that pressure is released at an appropriate rate so that it doesn't blow something up. Uh, similar to guardrails on the interstate. You know, as long as you stay between the lines or stay inside the guardrails, you're safe. God gives us certain laws or certain rules. And uh, he specifically says in Exodus chapter 21, verse 10, that if a man has uh, has a wife and he takes another wife, he's to make sure that her food, her clothing and her conjugal rights or the, the food, clothing and conjugal rights of the first are not diminished. Deuteronomy chapter 21, another example of a regulation, OK, is that if a man has two wives, if uh, one is loved and the other unloved, the the true firstborn, though she be of the unloved, must still be given the firstborn status. Deuteronomy 17, 16, as mentioned by Mr. Uh, Pastor Holloway, um, talking about the fact that uh, a king was not to multiply wives. Well, it also says that he's not to multiply horses. And, uh, and there's some other instructions there that we'll have to look at if our hermeneutic is consistent. Does God ever regulate sin? Does he ever say, if you're going to sin, this is how you do it righteously? I think not. So those commands, by definition, tell us that it's OK to do it as long as we stay within his guardrails. God causes polygyny. Genesis chapter 29, verse 21 through 30, 24 gives us the story of Leah, Rachel, Bilhah and Zilpah. And we find that Leah's womb is open and Rachel's is not. And after Leah has four sons, she goes to Jacob and says, give me sons or I will die. And he says, I'm not the one that opens wombs. That's God. Well, she brings Bilhah and uh, Bilhah has a son. And immediately uh, Rachel says, God has vindicated me. She gives credit to the most high. And uh, Bilhah has two sons. And then Leah figures out that her womb has closed. Who closed her womb? Oh, wait, it was the most high, because then what happens is she brings Zilpah to Jacob and gives Zilpah, her maidservant, to Jacob as a as a wife. And she bears two uh, sons. And then, oh, look, God opens Leah's womb back up and rewards her with two more sons, the first of which she names Issachar. And she says, because I gave my maid to my husband. And then after all of that, was God somewhere sleeping? Was he off on a vacation or did he suddenly have a have a, a uh, an awakening? No, it was at that point that he opened Rachel's womb. He had a purpose and he had a plan. He caused polygyny in that circumstance. God commands polygyny in some circumstances. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, is what we would know as the law of the leveret. If uh, uh, brothers dwell together and one dies without, a, a married brother dies without leaving an heir to carry on his name, the command is that uh, a brother or a near kin is to take that widow and and raise up seed for the deceased brother in order to preserve his name in Israel. 
and then any future children are his. Uh, they belong to him. And there is no caveat in that commandment that says, oh, by the way, if the guy's married or already has a wife, that he doesn't have to fulfill this. That's just not true. He commands polygyny in that circumstance, even if the man already has a wife. God blesses polygyny. We saw that in Genesis chapter 30, verses 6 and 18 with Rachel and with um, Leah. Genesis chapter 16 is the story of Hagar <clears throat> and uh, Sarah. And, uh, you know, of course, our, our, my, uh, the men across the aisle here had some not nice things to say about Sarah and Hagar <clears throat> in that circumstance. And yet what we find is that in verse 9, the angel of the Lord sends Hagar back to her mistress and blesses Ishmael and promises great blessings. And then in the midst of um, Ishmael and Hagar being in the family, God continues and blesses Abraham. We see in 17, he receives the blessing of uh, circumcision and, uh, and a great promise. If you continue to walk before me blameless, I will bless you. And the Most High does. We see 18 Chapter 21, the coming of Isaac, the binding of Isaac in 22. These are all blessings that are blessings that God does to a polygynist. Okay. First Samuel chapter one and one and two, we see the story of Penina and Hannah, and everybody wants to read the competition into that. Uh, and this is a priest. He knows the law. He knows the law. Elkanah knows the law. And uh, at the same time, his wife, Hannah is barren, and we get the prophet Samuel out of this. But the biggest blessing that we can see from all of this is the 12 tribes of Israel from the great patriarch Jacob, uh, four wives and 12 sons. We see that God approves of polygyny. In 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 2 and 3, it says, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest, and Jehoiada gave him two wives, and they bore him sons and daughters. I can say the whole thing in one breath. And, uh, you know, what part of Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord do we not understand? First Samuel chapter 12, verse 8, David already had seven wives and ten concubines, and God said nothing. He was a man after God's own heart. He's writing scripture. He's the king of Israel. He's a warrior. He has prophesied. We have all of these things. God says he's a man after his own heart. God didn't have a problem with it. What he had a problem with was when David took the wife of another man. That's the definition of adultery. Go look at, uh, at uh, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, as I have already mentioned. But here's the most stunning piece of information for you gentlemen. God practices polygyny. All of scripture is a polygynous love story from beginning to <clears throat> end. God portrays himself as a polygynist. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, it says in that passage that he divorced the house of Israel, but did not divorce the house of Judah. How do you divorce one house and not the other? You can't divorce half of a woman. He pictures himself as married to two brides. Ezekiel chapter 23, verses 1 through 5, confirm this when he says, he says, it's not the prophet saying, he says through the prophet, I took two sisters, daughters of one mother, and they bore me sons and daughters, and they are Ahola and Aholabah, and that is uh, that the capitals, Jerusalem and Samaria of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, house of Israel, house of Judah. Now, one of you mentioned uh, the new covenant, and it says in Jeremiah chapter 31, Behold, I will make a new covenant in those days with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made in those days when I was an husband to them, to, to them. Okay, it speaks of the same two that Jeremiah has already spoken of, and it's confirmed again in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 24, when he says, my two families, over and over, my two families families. Now, I really appreciate there's actually a fifth place that he refers to himself as the husband of two brides, but it's a little bit hidden. It happens to be in Isaiah chapter 54. And when you talk about verse five, it comes right after verse one. And in verse one, it specifically says, shout for joy, O barren one who have born no children. It's a picture of Rachel. Break forth into joyful singing. Cry aloud, you who have, have travailed for the sons of the desolate one, Rachel, 
will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, Leah. There you go. The whole story, all of scripture is about the restoration of the house of Israel with the house of Judah, uh, the two brides. But interestingly, the Messiah also portrays himself as a polygynist in two very important places in scripture. Matthew chapter 20, 22, verses 1 through 10 in parable, the great king preparing weddings, plural, for his son, except your English translation does not say that. And if you haven't thought to look at the Greek behind it, you would not know that four times in that parable, he refers to weddings, plural, gamus, plural. It is a, it's noun, accusative, plural, masculine, all four places. And it happens again in Matthew chapter 25 with the parable of the uh, 10 virgins. The, the uh, one taking the 10 virgins takes five into the weddings, plural. The English translates it as wedding feast, singular, but that is not what the Greek says. You need to go look at this, gentlemen. You need to do your homework. Um, right there is another place. Now, we'll get to the objections that you've given, but here's what I can tell you. We start with the question, is polygyny sin? And I can tell you unquestionably that God regulates it and he never, ever, ever regulates sin. He regulates polygyny. He causes it at points. There are times that he commands it. He blesses it. We see that over and over and over in scripture. He approves it. He practices and therefore polygyny is not and cannot be a sin. Oops. Oh, wait. Well done. Pete Rambo. Oh, wait a second. Lost you there for a second, Pete. Okay, still got about five minutes. You done? Is that close your open? Um, actually, you know, if I've got if I've got five minutes, uh, I would defer to my colleague, uh, biblical or Bible marriages, and see if he has anything he would like to add. I rolled through that at a high rate of speed. So, no, I think you're good. I think you covered everything, Pete. All right. Uh, before we get into the counter arguments or the uh, cross-examination, should I say? I wanted to play this clip real quick. I thought this would be fun. Hold on, where are we at? Hold on one second. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's just having a little fun. All right. Not meant to uh, be. Let's see here. All that was right. the rest of my five minutes. You used okay. it. Okay. Okay. So because uh, <laughs> Pastor JD and Pastor Mike gave their opening statements first, we're going to go ahead and let them do the cross-examination. You guys are going to have 45 minutes before we start the clock. Again, feel free. Actually, everybody leave a comment that's here. Please share. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to all these guys channels uh if you need links for anything you can we'll post them everybody actually guys you can post your own links if there's anything that you want people to have uh but let's go ahead and open it up 45 minutes starting now actually sorry let me let me set my clock real quick 40. sure is it yep is it 30 minutes a piece is that what we agreed well we're gonna go we're gonna i think i think we requested a little bit more. i don't know if somebody asked more than than 30 so we decided to go with 45 you have up to 45 okay so we have 45 minutes to cross-examine they have 45 minutes for us to be cross-examined yes. is that right yep okay. that's correct okay perfect all right so let me set the time okay so your first point was god uh and if you could yes or no feel free to elaborate but let's just try to get some initial questions here um you said that god does not god's law does not change right you said god's law does not change so here's my question um where does god command polygamy uh, in the case of the uh, leveret marriage would be a case where it is commanded for that to be taken care of. There's no caveat that says if the husband is or if the man is already married, he doesn't have to fulfill the commandment. The command is to is to raise up seed for your brother. OK, so outside of the lever, we'll talk about that in a second. But outside of the leveret marriage cases, does God ever command polygamy? Yes, in another circumstance, uh, if you go study the laws on uh, taking a, a virgin, um, 
then you become responsible for. There's no caveat that says that if you uh, are already married, you don't have to. And so that is a that is a similar but different circumstance. Okay, so in the case of rape, you're saying if a man rapes a woman, that's not necessarily they, rape. It can be okay. consensual. If but it, it includes rape, correct? It does include rape if oh, you want so, to turn it into so an emotion. If a man, if a man rapes a woman, you're saying that God commands polygamy in that case. If a married man rapes a woman, God commands polygamy. Is that is that your argument? Um, what I am saying is that is that according to what the passage says, that if a man takes a takes a virgin, and it it is not necessarily stating whether or not in that passage, I think whether or not seduces she, seduces is the is the translation that I've read. Okay, seduces. That does not necessarily mean uh, rape. And Bible marriage is this. You're you're free to chime in here too. Yeah. This is for okay. both of you guys. Okay. So, but God never commands polygamy, Just, right? I mean, you're you're saying based on arguments from silence that He doesn't specifically say, well, in the case of the married man, then these laws don't apply. But He doesn't actually ever command polygamy. No, you're, there's you're arguing, there's a command to fulfill the law of the Leveret marriage, and there's a command to take care of the woman that you have seduced. And there's no caveat that says you don't have to do it, or it's a different issue, or it's a, even adultery if the if uh, the man is already married. Okay. Does so, exist. so does God have to does God have to state a caveat for it to be understood? The command is if you seduce the virgin, you take her. She's yeah, yours. Does God does God have to state a caveat? Does God have to state a caveat for it to be true? It seems like you're arguing because he doesn't say in the case no, that no. if a man is married, no, therefore, that that somehow means that based on that silence, we should impose, well, th therefore, he must. But you're to me, you're reading that into the text. Why, why can't I simply say, no, I, I think in the case, obviously, if polygamy is not so, God's idea, or polygamy is sin, then obviously God would not command us to sin. And so it seems to be, to me, you're reading that into the text. So, J.D., um, let me ask you a question. In that situation where the man has a wife and he seduces a virgin and, and God, the command for him is to marry her. That's the remedy for that situation. OK, the, the command is if you seduce a virgin, you're to marry her. Right. We agree on that. That's what Exodus 22. No, I, 16 I, I, says. Think, I think I think the command is essentially that if you commit fornication, if you break it, you buy it. If you commit fornication, then okay. you are to marry her. If and this is the thing that's always forgotten, if the father agrees. Okay, so just let me ask you this. If the father agrees, and the man has one wife, and the command is if you seduce a virgin, what do you do? This is actually my time to cross-examine you, but I'll answer your question. Um, the, the rea So you are never commanded to sin. You should never sin. So if you are a married man, then no, you should have never seduced a woman in the first place, and then you should be punished. You should actually be put to death for your adultery. That is what ought to have happened, not for you to go on and continue to commit adultery with that same woman. That is that is evil. That is wrong. You should not be doing it. But I, I want to move on to, to another uh, question. You said God causes polygamy, and then go ahead, Mike, you can take over any time. Uh, you said God causes polygamy, and then you gave the situation of Jacob. Where does the text ever say that the women are prophesying from the Lord? Uh, the, uh, obviously, the father did not alter that and say, whoa, 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 time out. I didn't do this. He he is the one who opened and closed the womb in the timetable that he and the text is very explicit that Leah's womb was closed and then it opened back up after that. Does God reward sin? OK, so so all throughout the book of Jeremiah, there are false prophets that say, thus saith the Lord. And they don't. God doesn't say that. Does every time anyone has ever said anything incorrect about God, does God then put a caveat and say, oh, oh by the way, that, that I didn't mean that. Oh, by the way, that's not true. Is that how the Bible is written? That every time anyone ever says anything falsely about God, that there's a little caveat that says this is not true. You should not do this. This person is lying. Is that true? Um, we can say that, no, there's not always a caveat like that, but absolutely the fact remains that over and over God blesses and, uh, and, and demonstrates his blessing in the cir cir circumstance. He does not, um, reward sin. There's a no, no point. Does oh, okay. he, ever so he never reward sin. So did Tamar sin when she seduced Judah and committed incest? Was that sin? When he when Judah was going to burn Tamar alive for her sin, 
And she says, no, you are the man. He says, you are more righteous than I am. Was Tamar slash Judah sinning as they were committing incest? No. They were not. No. Okay. To start with, so, it's not so incest. To, 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 to pretend to be a prostitute, to, be, to pretend to be a prostitute, to be hired by a single man to hire a prostitute that you do not know is your daughter-in-law, that is not sin, according to your position. She did what was necessary in order to cause him to walk righteously and provide the seed that she was required according to the Leveret law. Did Judah know that he was sleeping with Tamar? No. Yes or no. Is it unholy and sinful to, to pay for prostitutes for sexual pleasure? It was not. Uh, Is it sinful I, to have sex with prostitutes? Yes, it's sin. If it, it is fornication, if you're not taking responsibility for the woman, is, is fornication sin? Yes. Well, hold on, let me let me interject because you said that Tamar sinned, but I think you're asking did the other the guy sin? I'm, I'm asking if Judah sinned when he thought he was sleeping with a prostitute, and I don't know if taking care of her is giving her a goat or not. But it is that sin to hire a prostitute for a goat and disappear. No, what, what she did was she set him up to walk in righteousness. I, I'm he talking about Judah. Right Judah today. is trying to have sex for a goat. Is Judah sinning when he does that? Judah was... Well, let me, let, let me change it this way slightly. Do we know that he was married or not? It, it does not appear that he was married. It, appear, it appears that his wife had died, and then he was apparently single and having sex with prostitutes. And I'm asking you, is it sin for a single man to have sex with prostitutes? It's fornication. Is it's fornication a sin? It is listed as a sin in, in most circumstances. Okay. Did God bless that sin with a child? He blessed, uh, not with one, but with two and the lineage of your Messiah. Okay, so that sounds like a great blessing to me. That sounds like a blessing that saved the entire earth. Now, does the fact that God blessed that sinful action then mean that God approves having sex with prostitutes for goats? Uh, the subject isn't sex with prostitutes for goats. The subject here is polygyny. Yes, but it was your point that said that because God blessed Jacob with his polygamy, therefore that this must be okay because God never blesses sin. And I've tried to show you from the very book that you're trying to prove polygamy from that God, in fact, does bless sin. But let's go to another more important subject. Did God bless the crucif crucifixion of Jesus Christ by sinful men? Sure. Sure. Okay, so does that disprove your notion that God never blesses the consequences of sin? I'm not saying that he never blesses the consequences of sin, but I am saying that he blessed all of, uh, all of creation with Israel. He blessed all of creation with the murder of his son. That does not prove that we should be murdering innocent men because we, we're jealous of them. All right, second question. Uh, you said God regulates polygamy. God would never regulate sin, therefore polygamy cannot be sin. That's what I think you said. So I did. Does, okay, so does God regulate rape? Didn't we just talk about a situation where God regulates rape? He, he has laws that allow the woman to be protected. And in the circumstances of rape, right? Yes. At least inclusive of the circumstances of rape, correct? Yes. Does that mean that rape is not sin? No, it does not mean rape is not sin. Okay, does God regulate miscarriage? When he talks about two men fighting and the woman, the, the child dies within the womb, does God regulate miscarriage? Miscarriage is not sin. When someone punches a pregnant woman and causes the baby to die, is that miscarriage a sin? The miscarriage is not a sin. So punching a pregnant woman in her, in her stomach, causing that baby to die, and to have a miscarrying womb is not sin. Is that what you're saying? You're saying that the miscarriage is the sin. It's not. The punching of the woman is a sin. Okay. So does God regulate laws about causing pregnant women to miscarriage? He regulates laws about, you know, punching people. Okay. Does that mean that punching people, especially pregnant women, causing them to miscarriage is therefore not a sin? 
No, but the 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 point of the matter is is that he puts a guardrail on something. He he never says do not take more than one wife. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. Does God regulate divorce? Yes. Right. Does God not say that he hates divorce? Actually, go back and look at that passage. It says he hates sending away. It does not say divorce. They're two very different. Uh, so God doesn't hate divorce. He is God a divorcee. Created, he is God, a divorcee. Okay, so God who created marriage does not hate divorce. God is a divorcee. What that passage, you go to Malachi chapter 3, verse uh, what, or 2.16. Is it 2.16, I think? Uh, it specifically uses a term that means sending away, and it's part. It's a two-part process from Deuteronomy chapter 24, where it tells us that a writ of divorce must be given and she must be sent away. What he hates is her being sent away without the writ of divorce. Okay, we, we can move on to the next question. The, the point is that God regulates a lot of things that are sinful, and we don't conclude because he regulates sinful actions, therefore they're not sinful. Um, okay, uh, you said that God is a polygamist. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and he so since God is portrayed as a polygamist, since God is portrayed as a polygamist, therefore polygamy must be okay, because God would never portray himself as something sinful. Is that your basic argument? Yes, that is my basic okay. argument. Does God put does God present himself as someone who commits incest? No. Okay. Does God say in his law that you are not to take a sister to women who are sisters, otherwise you would be committing incest? Read the verse. That's not what the verse says. It's so Leviticus take, chapter 18, can, verse 18, and it does not say what you just said. Okay, so you can it's take two sisters. Take two sisters at you, you're not to take the second sister as a rival. It speaks to the okay. intent of the reason why you take her. He describes himself exactly as Jacob taking two sisters, and neither are ever referred to as sins, as so, a rival. So as long as they like each other, you could take two sisters. Is that, is that your position? Uh, the they should get along, sure. So isn't that true? Right? Uh, Leviticus eighteen eighteen speaks to the man's intent. Yes, it, it's, true, forbidding, right? it's, it's forbidding him from doing it for a specific reason, and a specific reason is to vex his current wife. Okay, so your position is that you can take two sisters. Okay, let me ask you this: Does God ever present Himself as an unjust judge? He doesn't. He doesn't present himself as an unjust judge. So there's not a parable where God describes an unjust judge and then we're supposed to nag that unjust judge to get our, answer, our prayers answered. God never, that, that parable doesn't exist. Are you referring to Abraham? Are you familiar with that parable? It's in the New Testament. Jesus gives a parable of an unjust judge where a woman continues to nag him. And despite him being unjust and not caring about God, the woman continues to nag and she gets his way. Is that not a parable in the Bible where the unjust judge represents Jesus or God? It does. Does that prove that unjust judge, uh, judges are actually a good thing? Or is it a parable? He uses that as an illustration, but he does not describe the unjust judge as being a sinner. How could you be an unjust judge and not be a sinner? It's a, uh, I need to go back and look at that, but I think the judge is described as, as not being interested in listening to the case necessarily. Is, is that to, sinful? Is to be an unjust judge who does not fear God, is that not sinful? You could say that. Okay, so if God compares himself to an unjust judge, does this mean that being an unjust judge is okay? Is that is that reasonable logic? No. Okay, in in the in the law of God, so I would say in the same way, just because God presents himself as a polygamist does not prove that polygamy is okay. It, it just does not. It simply does not follow. Um, in, in the law, it says that you are not allowed to divorce your wife and to bring her back. Is that is that right? Yeah. You're not allowed to divorce and bring her back, right? Well, it's more specific than that. Okay, please clarify. It's my understanding that if you divorce her and she marries again, and then the other husband after that divorces her, she can't come back to you. Okay, so when can you take her back? Or or he dies because she's been you, defiled. Okay. You so can't. If, 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 she, if, he, if she's divorced from that husband, you can't take her back. And if he dies, you can't take her back. So when could you take her back? I don't believe that you could. Okay. So under the law, if you divorce someone, you can never have them back. 
That's correct, right? No, you just mischaracterize that. If you divorce and she remarries, that's what you see in the New Testament, where it says that for a believing wife, if she leaves, she is to remain unmarried or seek reconciliation. If she marries again, you can't take her back. I'm talking about under the law. If, if you send her, this is not a protection of a woman. If you, you can't just send her away two weeks later, call her back, send her away two more weeks, call her back. Doesn't it say if you, if you send her, you can never take her back? It doesn't say that. Where does it say that? From my understanding, that was the law. B, is that is that your understanding of the law? The uh, Deuteronomy says that if she goes to another man and then he divorces her, she cannot return to the first husband. Okay, fine. That's that's good enough. So when when God divorced Israel, who was a harlot, being seduced by a bunch of other nations, did she not go and marry those other nations? Yes. Okay. Did God take her back? And here is where it takes knowing the law in order to be able to, uh, to understand that. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I speak to those who know the law. And specifically, the point that he makes is that in that circumstance, the husband died to nullify the, the writ of divorce against the wife, and then he was raised so, to newness of life. Okay, so let's go back, though. If you divorce a woman mm -hmm. and she goes and marries another man, Yes. And that, that man dies or whatever, right. you can't take her back. Correct. If you did, you'd be a sinner. Correct. And yet God is portrayed as divorcing Israel, she going and marrying many lovers, then him taking her back. That is correct. And this is the so, great mystery. No, listen, time out. Okay. okay. This is the great, I get to explain this. This is the great mystery that, that they couldn't understand. And this is why the Messiah had to come and die so that the... He was the first husband, okay? He was the one who stood on Mount Sinai and gave the commandments, and he was the first husband, and he died. It nullified the original writ of divorce, and when he was raised, she could then be returned to him in newness of life. It's a it's a different contract. He's been dis okay. he's been dead. Okay, so where but does the, the law, law say? Because because you this is what you asked about Leverett laws. It, it never specifically said if he's. Married, you can't commit adultery and continue to marry other women. That was your argument. So where in that law does it say, well, you can if you die, resurrect, and and then you can remarry your wife? Where, where does that say? What does it say in that in the law? No, what it what it says is, it, uh, Paul explains that to us in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and he says that you have to know the law in order to understand that she can be remarried because the original um, the original husband has been deceased. Okay. My, my only my only point about this is that I think there's a much easier explanation, simply that just because God is described parabolically in, in figures doesn't mean that we're supposed to draw more conclusions about certain morality of divorce laws from, from those kind of things. Mike, why don't you uh, ask some questions and then I can sure. jump back in. Go ahead. Sure. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter number 18, verse 18, uh, where it says um, here, let me just read it one more time here. In Leviticus 18, 18, sorry, I had it up. But let me just read it real quick. In Leviticus 18, 18, where it says, uh, nor shall you take a woman as a rival to her sister to uncover her nakedness while the other is alive. Isn't it not the context that the fact that his first wife is alive while taking her sister as a wife, what causes the rival? See, he's 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 saying as a rival, what makes her a rival is the fact that he's taking her while the first wife is alive. Is not the, that the clear context? You're reading that into the text. If you read the verse immediately before that, it specifically says that uh, you shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, nor shall you take her son's daughter or daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, implying that we've got two separate laws here for. Uh, not to take women or a second woman in certain circumstances. So um, the the verse 17 would not even be necessary if verse 18 stood alone as you want it to stand. You're no. you're assuming that it creates a rivalry, and that's just not true. Well, why, I, no, I don't think so. Uh, I, and again, I, I, remember I, the caveat. I happen to know. I happen to know. I have on my oh. channel an interview with a family that the, the husband has two sisters, sororal polygyny. It I would ask you if that's what makes it true, but I think we both know the answer to that. But 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 let's see why why does he add the caveat while she is yet alive? Again, 
I, I believe maybe we just disagree on that. Uh, you disagree then that the clear context is that the second wife is what makes it a rival <laughs> wife. But because his wife, no, I think the translation, lie. the translations are different there. Um, hey. I, I think the intent matters in the man. It is it, if you are taking it with the intent to vex the sister, the the wife that you have, that is what that is what matters. But like Pete said, if polygyny wasn't wasn't allowed in the first place, if it was a sin in the first place, these two laws are not necessary. We uh, don't need to know that we can't marry a sister in order to vex our wife if we can't marry another woman, period. We don't need to know we can't marry um, my wife's mother if we know we can't marry a second woman in the first place. These laws are unnecessary if polygyny is a sin and forbidden. So, yeah, but that, well, uh, Again, I think, I think Pastor J.D. Martin, as well as uh, Pete, Pete, made it clear that there are instances where God puts regulations on sin. Could this not be a regulation yeah, that he's, he's putting on it. sinful acts as, as was yeah. already brought out? All right. Yeah. Well, what, one, All one, right. we'll, we'll jump in real quick. Uh, let me ask sure. you some just on this and we can move on from Leviticus. Is it not the case for, for the, for the audience, especially that Leviticus 18, this whole section is about incest laws. Is that not what's going on here? There's a transition that happens at verse 18, uh, but the first portion of it has to do with familial relations, yes. So, so verse 17, as an example, you should not take a woman and her daughter, right, at the same time, you, or you shouldn't be doing this at period. The, the con so, so only in verse 18 is it, well, you shouldn't do this if there's a mental thing going on in your mind, but you can do it. But as long as you don't have this mental thing going on, that that's the only one you're, you you have that interpretation. Is that correct? Everything else is just flat out. Don't don't marry your aunt. Don't marry your sister in law. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Woman and daughter. But the sister as well, if you want to, as long as you like mentally don't think of them as a rival. Is that is that your interpretation? It gives a specific. N none of the other ones have a specific caveat there. None of the others have a specific reason. This gives intent. It speaks to the intent of the husband. Okay. Um, just, just letting you guys know you got about 22, 22 minutes left. So you're about halfway yeah, through. I just want to ask another question and take over, Mike. Um, can you, you give me a single here. example of a successful polygamous relationship in the Bible? Can you give me an example of a successful monogamous relationship in the Bible? Adam, Adam and Eve. Thing, uh, well, sin entered the world. How did how successful was that? Success, successful marriage does not mean it won't be it won't any include sinful. I'm asking you, has okay. polygamy uh, ever produced life and happiness and joy? Can you give me a single example? There's a bunch of polygamy that ever ended well that produced life, I, happiness, joy, prosperity. Go. Bible marriage is God. Well, like Peter said, the first monogamous marriage that we know of ended and led all of uh, humanity to sin and death, and uh, their 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 son murdered his brother. So that's not a good start for monogamy. Um, but it's a fa it's a fallacy to to even argue that it's a fallacy to say um, because you know we see some bad examples in polygyny in the Bible that polygyny equals bad and and just as much as it would be a fallacy for me to say because Adam and Eve ended the way it did in sin and death then monogamy is bad uh, no 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 fallacious I'm argument I, I'm simply asking you I'm, I'm I'm assuming the answer is no that's why you're answering this way no can no no the answer is not no the answer to your question your question was can we name a a, a positive example of a polygamy in marriage? the Bible. I think the 12 tribes of Israel um, is, a, is a pretty positive example. Okay, so the, Leah's, was Leah miserable? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I could throw a rock blindfolded at Christian marriages that are far more miserable with so, monogamy so than, when that, Leah, than what's described in that in that. So when, uh, Leah is, when Leah is buying her husband for mandrakes as a prostitute, she's prostituting her own husband, that sounds like a healthy marriage to you. You think she was prostituting him? I think that buying someone for sex sounds like prostitution to me. And I'm thinking I've been married for 13 years. I've never had to buy sex with my wife. I don't plan on it. This is not normal. Okay. You, and you don't think there's just more to that passage than what you I, did? It's completely of... unnormal to buy sex from your spouse. Yes. I think okay. it's completely unnormal. Well, it's to... also unnormal for us to talk about walk around talking about mandrakes too. So uh, it's just not something that we that, do. That's culturally odd, but that's not immoral so, and so freakish. Now we're appealing, but now we're appealing to culture. For those things, but not for everything else. You're not to, being to buy sex from your spouse when First Corinthians seven says that your spouse is supposed okay. to be your sex partner. So, that, yeah, um, that's weird. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, what about Gideon? Okay, Gideon 70, had seventy sons on account of his many wives. Yes, and that resulted in mass murder. No, no, no. But we're talking about the marriages. Yeah, right? the, you're saying marriage, happy. Marriage, you're you're marriage asking about family. happy marriages, right? 
marriage and family go together, right? God brought the two together to do godly offspring. That resulted in mass murder of all of Gideon's sons. That does all not right, sound like a good example. All, of, all right, so time murder. out, time out, time out. You said that results in mass murder for all of Gideon's sons, and so you're using the sins of the son in order to judge the marriage, right? Yes, that's exactly what yes, that, yes, that's correct. Go ahead. Yes, you said correct. I couldn't use Cain as an example for murdering his brother as an example for a bad monogamous relationship with Adam and Eve. Okay, let me, I'll just say it like this. Um, in the case of Gideon, we have almost no information about what that what his relationship and marriage goes from. So the only example of a, a sup supposed positive example that you can give me of polygamy in the Bible is a case where we have no information about any of their marriage. And that results in one brother killing all the rest. And if you want to exclude that last part, fine. Do you have, going back to Jacob and Leah, so we have the prostitution going on. Is it not true that one of, one of the sons of uh, Jacob has sex with one of his wives? Did, did that happen? A sure, supposedly again, good example. Sure, but again, this is this this is you know that you're taking the sin of the son and uh, and saying that and, and, and the wife and the wife, right? Uh, Happy uh, women don't uh, usually have sex with your son. Assuming she was complicit. It you're doesn't say she was raped. You're reading it. Say, in the text. So, so what, is the, what is the, what is the bad outcome from Hannah? After uh, Hannah was absolutely life. miserable. She was absolutely miserable. It says that in the text. Yes, it does. The whole it context does. is she's miserable. She's being harassed. She's crying in the temple. She's begging God for the child. This is not a happy marriage. She's begging God for a child, though, isn't she? Yeah. She's, she's not begging God marriage. that she only has, you know, that she doesn't have to share a husband. The wife, you, okay, I don't have time to go. Mike, if you want to pull that text up, that's yeah. fine. There's no way you're going to look at that example and tell me that's a happy marriage. There's all kinds of conflict and strife and jealousy she's even called a rival i believe in the text that doesn't seem like a happy marriage yeah, but, to me. but but where is the sin though the sin is not that they're sharing a husband the sin is is, is in the women specifically the other wife who was mistreating her you what, see Michael, so what I, happens yeah. is what happens is okay what happens is we don't look at the actual sin and we miss the sin when we talk about these instances because we're so, we're so busy talking about monogamy and polygyny, by the way, both of which are not biblical terms. Correct. Marriage is the biblical term. You will not find polygyny in the Bible and you will not find monogamy in the Bible. So instead of focusing, but here's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Instead of focusing on what the women in that marriage did or the marriages did, which is harshly treating the other woman, making fun of her or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, we don't talk about that. And we just say, we're going to blame polygyny. And it was Elkanah's fault for taking two wives. And so we excuse the sin. No, no, I'm not doing that at all. The question that what I said was that polygamy produces death, unhappiness, misery, and envy. That's what sin produces. It produces isn't death, it? unhappiness, misery, and all kinds of additional evil. And Again, I asked you, I asked, one, second, one second, I asked you for a single example of a good case of polygamy that didn't produce death, destruction, misery, and envy. And so far, all you've given me is Jacob, death, destruction, envy, and misery, and Hannah, death, destruction, envy, and misery. So no, I gave you Gideon, and I gave you, we could give you Joash, we could give you another, there's about 35 other examples in but, scripture. But do, we have any exa do we have any information about Jairus's marriage? Why do we have the information about the marriages that we do? Because this is the, this is the, 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 the Again, so you're, you're going back to the, the fallacious argument. You're going back to the fallacious argument of polygyny equals bad, so we have bad outcomes, and yet we can point to many monogamous situations that equal bad and bad outcomes, but you don't apply that evenly. You're not applying that evenly. The first monogamous marriage that we know of led all of us to all of the sin that you're talking about, to all of the death that you're talking about, okay, to so all you, the problems you, that you're talking I'm, about. I'm assuming so that it would be just – hey – it would be just as fallacious of me to say monogamy is bad because Adam and Eve were God's first no. perfect example. And in perfection, in perfection, no. they screwed it up. No, it, it, right? this, is, this is my reply to you. You cannot argue that polyg mon monogamy always produces death, destruction, misery, and anarchy in the Bible. It's not simply not true. If you ask me, do I have a positive example? I can give you one. You have Joseph and Mary. That's a very positive example right there where they have a very happy and successful marriage, and it doesn't produce that. You can see the same thing at Isaac and Rebecca. Very happy marriage. doesn't. How do you, produce know, how do you know Isaac and Rebecca uh, were monogamous? Everything we have from the text. But do you know that? As much as as much as you know, 
No, no, no. Everything, do you everything know? Everything we have in the text. Do you know that no Isaac indication. only had one wife? Does it say explicitly Isaac only had one wife ever? I don't think we need to say that. It, we, of course, it needs to say that, because otherwise, you're arguing from silence that he was a monogamous, and we cannot prove that. No, it's not arguing from silence. I, yes. I think it's certainly implied in the text. There's no, there's no lineage. There's no gene genealogy that follows of Isaac's other descendants, which clearly would have been in the text if had it been. You're actually imposing on the text with the with the assumption that potentially Isaac had multiple wives when the text gives us no indication of that. Let me ask. I'm, not, I'm not imposing that. I'm, I'm just okay. saying you're making an argument from well, silence, well, and I could show you that I could make the same argument from silence. I just don't need that argument to make my case. Let me ask another question. In Second Corinthians chapter number seven, where Paul says it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife. And the word wife there, Ganate, is in the singular in the Greek, uh, and let each woman have her own husband and that again is in the singular as you all would agree that a woman can only have one husband but i don't think you would agree that a, uh, a man can only have one wife uh, how do you harmonize second corinthians chapter number seven with your uh, doctrine that polygyny is biblical you want to take that pete sure if you go read the greek you'll recognize that there are two different words for own one is heotu and the other is idios and uh, idios is used in such places as every man went to his own city. Well, he doesn't own the city. It doesn't belong to him. He actually technically belongs to the city, where heatu always means belongs to himself. So basically that verse right there, Paul, in, uh, in a very tactful way, leaves the door ajar by saying that each man is to possess his wife. However, the wife is to be possessed by her husband, and just as a master can have multiple servants uh, and a man can have multiple wives the same way a city can have multiple people that belong to it. Well, uh, uh, okay, well, so I, let's I, read I, on I, a little further. Let's read on a little further. Uh, sure. the, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. In the case of polygyny, which wife owns the husband's body? Uh, neither of them do. Uh, the context of this passage, what Paul is teaching here is about sex. It's about sex within marriage. Right. Uh, Peter just described in um, 1 Corinthians uh, earlier in the passage where Paul very specifically chooses two Greek words that are different when he could have chosen the same words if he was trying to argue for monogamy, but he didn't. He did that in order to, to, to make sure he made sure he was still talking about the man as the one who exclusively owns the woman. And the woman belongs to the man Wait, now. Says, but hold on, doesn't I'm, have authority. Yes, but I'm going to that now. What Paul is now then going to is describing that sex is a right. It is a fundamental right in marriage, and he's appealing to Exodus 21:10, I believe, when he's doing that by saying the wife has authority over his body. The husband cannot deny sex to the wife, and the wife cannot deny sex to the husband. You cannot take what Paul is talking about right here, which is a very specific and isolated thing, which is telling uh, telling the man and the woman not to deny sex and then go outside of that context and then apply it to, uh, in contradiction to everything else in scripture that says the man exclusively owns the woman and the woman belongs to the man so all paul is describing here is stop denying each other don't don't deny sex the the husband has a right to sex and the wife has a right to sex neither of them okay, I mean, wait, wait, the husband I, I, I have a, i have a i have a question so i want to go back cuz whenever someone tries to greek you um, it's always a, a real question of what's going on. So you're trying to tell me that the word idion being used here necessitates that the word own here doesn't actually mean own? Is that what you're saying? That all major translations are completely wrong here by translating own as own in both places, and it actually has some specialized meaning that doesn't mean own. Is that, what, is that your position? What it, uh, idios or it, idios is a significantly weaker form of ownership than heatu. And if you, okay. uh, uh, and, and, uh, I actually have some stuff recently that I got from a, um, Greek scholar okay. that teaches at the, at the collegiate level. No, so, but JD, so the, the in, thing Matthew, is in Matthew, in Matthew 22, five, when it says each one went to his own idion farm, that's a weaker form of a farm. Like th this farm doesn't fully, he doesn't fully possess this farm like he would if it was out too. Is that, is that your position? 
No, it's the it's the same thing. It, it's the same thing as each goes to his own city. He doesn't own the city. Doesn't belong to him. So he doesn't own he, his farm. He belongs to the city. Okay, Matthew twenty five fourteen says that he called his own slaves. Same word. He doesn't fully own these slaves. Hmm. No, Mark, Mark, four, Mark four thirty four says Jesus went to his own disciples. He doesn't own these disciples. They're not his own disciples. It seems to me that you're Greeking people and making the, because they're ignorant of Greek, they actually think that this word means something and, other than and, and, own. and where are all of those passages that you're getting from coming from? Where where are you getting those from, JD? I'm I'm reading the Greek right here. Wait, 6, but if you look at but if you look at the lexicon though, right? If you look at the lexicon, does it does it not denote that there's multiple different definitions? Yes, but this word right. can mean so own. particularly it's choosing own. the ones that fit your case only and no, not no, and ignoring no, I'm not. the fact I, that what I'm simply what I'm simply showing is like Luke 6 41 that take the log out of your own eye. Is, is this some lesser ownership of your eyeball? Okay, so why does Paul choose no. you two different words? It's the same reason because we do it all the time. I can say I have wrath and fury. I have anger and hate. I, I can use words as synonyms all of the time. We do that in English all the time. And to say, to say, oh, well, it means some specialized difference. People make the exact same fallacious argument when it comes to Jesus when he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he uses slightly different words. People think, oh, it means this word and that word. It doesn't. It's a fallacious argument. And that's why no translation agrees with that. So, kind so of, just, just answer Jesus. me this question then. Based on the definition in the lexicons of that word, can it be read the way we're saying it can be read? Uh, can you tell me again how you're trying to read it? That, that what, what word are you trying to put in there instead of own? That the wife belongs to the man by definition, and the husband exclusively owns the woman. And also, just just answer this: Would that be would that fit with the rest of Scripture? Would that fit and would that harmonize with the rest of how Scripture describes the marital relationship? So just so I understand, and, 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 just, so I, just so I understand what you're saying, you're saying that he uses this special word of ownership to describe the woman as his piece of property, while the 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 word own here would at first to or husband just saying it's your husband. So this is your husband, but in the case of the woman, you're, this is your piece of property. Is that is that what you're asking can, me? Can I ask? Okay, can I ask you this question then? Who does the woman belong to, biblically? God. The woman belongs to God. Okay, so you you have a wife, right? Yes, 13 years. Can I take your wife? No. Why? Because she's my wife. But So she's your property? She, no, no. My wife's not my property. She, she doesn't belong to you? Just because I think my kids belong to me, that doesn't mean my kids are my property. Okay, but things again, are, I'm asking you, know, you so... There's things the, that belong the, to me that doesn't mean my property. My okay, eyes so belong the, to me, but that doesn't mean that my eyes are my property. But you're the one who used the word property, not me. I was trying I to said she belongs to him. I said she it belongs sounded like, to him. It sounded like you were saying property. So if you weren't meaning property, when what okay, way is it different that the woman belongs to the man, that the man doesn't belong her own husband, own wife? How are those two things different? Because all through Scripture, it's clear that the husband has exclusive ownership of the woman, and the woman does not own the man. Yes. But it says right here. No, that but that's okay. But does, is Paul wife. going to is yeah. Paul going to contradict Torah? I don't think. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. I don't. I don't think he's doing that. Go ahead. We got about five minutes left, guys. Almost six, actually. Okay. Yeah, I clearly don't think he's doing that uh, uh, either. Um, but let me just bring up another example that we all talked about uh, in terms of uh, a man taking his wife uh, back. Uh, in the story of Gomer and Hosea, uh, does not Gomer represent backsliding Israel? In that story, um, she does, I believe. Very good. And in that she represents backsliding Israel, does not Gomer go and purchase her back uh, without dying? And I'm only bringing that up because your point was to try to come to the New Testament in Romans chapter number seven to illustrate that there had to be a death that took place in order to uh, go back to a wife that has departed. Uh, so I'm showing in the case where God sets up the scenario with in order to do it according to what the law says. Now, the scenario that God sets up there is to use Gomer and Hosea as a picture of himself. But obviously, Hosea couldn't be put to death and then raised to life in order to make the illustration that he ultimately carries out with Yeshua. 
Well, he yeah. ultimately carries that out with Yeshua as well. But at, uh, but but if you study the context of the Old Testament, you'll find that he carries that out even before Yeshua in returning uh, Israel back to the land through the hands of Ezra and Nehemiah. So 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 uh, again, the, which is part of what the prophecy was. So again, well, I just wanted to point that out. I just wanted to point out. the house of Judah back to the well, land. Well, the house of Judah Israel had already been scattered and was right. gone. Well, was Judah scattered at the time? <laughs> was was Judah a part of being scattered as well? Did she not go and come back? Did Judah, Judah. not go a whoring after other? So uh, how do we know? Uh, in, uh, how do we know in Hosea that it's not two women? Well, and, and that's a good question, uh, and I'll answer that. Even though <laughs> we'll wait, but 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 again, remember, remember the the two ness of Israel was as a result of Israel's sin. But when you yep. study Israel in context, Israel is one nation, which is why all throughout Scripture, from Ezekiel chapter thirty six, you find God bringing the two branches back together as one. So this was not a polygamous relationship, right? God was and dealing yet, with the situation as two women through mm -hmm. their own fall. But if Israel is one that, nation. Jacob was one. Person. That actually. Actually, in Ezekiel 23, verses 1 through 5, God is very specific that he viewed them as two brides before they left Egypt. And he viewed them as two when they stood at Mount Sinai, as illustrated by uh, the new covenant, when he speaks of the two that he took. as uh, one, one, one quick question on that as well. Again, the, the, the whole context of this is, is bringing out the fact that God uses analogies uh, in the scriptures themselves that if they were applied to other people, they would be sinful. That's the point. So exactly. you, you've argued, you've argued that uh, in Leviticus 18, which I think you're probably alone, but that's fine, uh, that you can take these sister wives, but as long as they're not rivals. My question is, was Judah and Jerusalem rivals to each other? Judah and Jerusalem? Judah, Judah and, Israel. and Israel, excuse me. Were they rivals to each other? Yes, they did. They they were in rivalry after after the the split in when the Northern Kingdom rebelled against the House of Which David. Is the only time they exist as two rebelled against the House of David, not against the House of Judah. Which is the only yes, two but, times. That, the only but time what you're talking exists. about again, JD. The problem here is you keep going to what happens as a result, and the law is about what the man's intent originally was. No, no, no. That that wasn't my point. My point was this. That the, the, your, the argument was God is a polygamist or God is portrayed as a polygamist. Therefore, this can't be sinful. OK, but I'm I'm pointing out based on that same argument, God is presented as a polygamist incestuous person, too, because <laughs> these two sisters are clearly in rivals to, re, to each other. So based on your own. No, logic, that's not. Then, no, that's not. That's not the point. The point of Leviticus 18, 18 says, do not take a sister in order to vex your current wife. What happens as a result of taking two sisters is not the point of the law. So God did not take Israel and Judah to vex each other. So he wouldn't be violating that law. So, so, so let me understand. So if you, if you take two sisters and you have every reason to believe that they are going to be vexing each other and full of rivalry from each other, that you can see it already. They're already doing that to each other. You have perfect absolute certainty that that's going to happen and you still take them you think that you're fulfilling that law what do you mean fulfilling it you, you think, think that you're okay it? because you didn't no. technically you're not doing it you're just you like no. you like her you like her you know they're gonna fight each other but hey you just gotta be you know you just want the women so you just gotta get them and so you get them anyways despite the fact that you know two weeks later sure enough they're at each other's eyes they're hating each other your 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 house is full of strife rivalry all of that you're saying that that's okay JD, i think i think you're making the point if you knew it ahead of time and you did it anyway, you'd be violating that law. So does God yes. have perfect foreknowledge that these two nations are going to be fighting each other? In fact, but when he married them, they were fighting each other. Does he? Okay, I, I think we get the point of that. Mike, do you want to ask a different question? You got about 20 seconds. No. If you, want, if you want to go ahead and ask one more, go ahead. And We'll give you, extra you got one, JD. You can go ahead. Last one. Would you want forget forget the law for a second? Just your own heart. Do you honestly think it's loving to have sex with another woman other than your wife? To your wife, to your wife's feelings. Do you think that's loving to her? If she is your wife, if you are uh, if you are taking care of her, if you're covering her, if you're protecting her, yes, that is loving. It is meeting the needs of the woman. So, so right. just, just, just clarify real quick. I'm sorry. Sure, so it's loving for you to say, babe, I'm about to go have sex with this woman. And she did know 
despite you've been married for 30 years, that you're having sex with some other woman, that this is loving to your other wife, your actual wife that you've been married to for 30 years, that's loving. Just, 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 just to be clear. It is taking care of the needs of more than one woman. And there's nothing at all wrong with that. Nowhere in scripture, you have not given us a, a, a verse yet. In fact, it would be a sin not to. Right. Exodus 21.10 would, would, would make that clear. All right. That's it. 45 minutes is up. Now for the pro-polygyny side. We're going to do our cross-examination. Let's go ahead and set our clocks. Who's going to take that? Is that going to be Bible marriages or Pete? Bible marriages is leading. Okay. You ready to Bible marriages? Sure. I still just have... Go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask everybody if they're enjoying the conversation. Again, just if you're tuning in, there is going to be a section for Q&A after this cross-examination before closing statements. And then uh, we'll be curious to hear you guys, what, what side you landed on this, if we changed anybody's mind. Um, but it's so far, this has been great guys. Really grateful to have you all here. I'm highly impressed by your knowledge. Go ahead, Bible marriage. What were you going to say? Uh, I still haven't heard to this, to this moment, um, from the opposing side, they did, I believe they did say they believe polygyny or as I would call it, multiple marriages is a sin. Uh, I still have not heard a single law from them that they're referencing to, to say that it is a sin definitively. Um, can you guys tell us where we can find that in scripture? Yeah. Every time it says thou shalt not commit adultery. Right. Okay. So you believe that a man with more than one marriage is committing adultery? Yes. Okay. So when do you think the, that the, the first time that God, um, created a, a, a adultery law was, or when do you think a, adultery was a thing for God that he wouldn't want to be broken? Well, God never, never eternal law. You go ahead. Exactly. Okay, so so would you say, I mean, uh, as soon as Adam and Eve were created, adultery was a thing. It, it would be before that, God God's eternal law definitely changes. So okay. as soon as God created marriage and created marriage in the context of sex, then always to have sex outside of marriage, uh, any sham marriage, any fake marriage is also not a real marriage at all. So okay, but so, that's the definition. Yeah. So do you think Abraham knew what adultery was? Yes. Okay. And we we acknowledge we all acknowledge that Abraham had multiple marriages. Yes, he also lied. Yeah, uh, that's not what I asked. Wife, let's, stick, let's stick to the subject. That's not what I asked. I said we all acknowledge that Abraham had multiple marriages. Yes. yes. Yeah. Abraham had multiple wives Single at different man. times, but he also had multiple concubines. Correct. Absolutely. All right. So in Genesis twenty six five, it says, "I will do this because Abraham listened to me, obeyed all my requirements, all my commands, all my decrees and instructions." How did Ab- how, how and why would God say that about Abraham if he's flagrantly, unrepentantly committing perpetual adultery with not just one concubine, but multiple other women outside of Sarah? How could how could Mike, he possibly Mike, say this? that? Go right ahead. Mike, Go right ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, first off, uh, we don't know how many times he had sex with Hagar. Uh, he might have just had sex with Hagar once. Uh, his his other concubine, you say multiple, there's, we only have record of two. Uh, the text at least presents it as that he takes this concubine after Sarah is death. So it's entirely possible that the only time that Abraham ever committed adultery was with uh, Hagar, that one instance. How's that possible, uh, Paul? Also- How's that possible when it says in Genesis 25, 6, it says he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines? Plural. Plural. Yeah, yeah. That <clears throat> that could be referring to Ishmael and and Hagar was uh was a concubine. Um, but again, even that's if singular. that is the case, even if no, that's Hagar one and then whatever Kazai, whatever her name no, was. No, it says uh, he gave Kazai, gifts to the before. sons plural of his concubines, plural. Yeah. So he had I've multiple already, sons I've by given, multiple yes, concubines. I've you, yes, I've given you two. We know we know the names of them. And we know the two mothers, two mothers. He had one wife, which was Sarah. And then he had two concubines. Even if it was, which was, if it was just two, that's still three marriages, which would mean two of those were perpetual adultery, as you guys called no, it, no, right? No. no, only again, if Sarah was dead at the time of the taking of Keturah, I'm just going to say, okay, then that's not, that's just remarriage. There's no problem. And he already had divorced Hagar long ago. So, it's entirely possible that he only committed adultery one time. And as far as how could God Does say it, this is about there anywhere in scripture, the same way 
the same, let me finish the same way that God can say that David is a man after his own heart. And yet he still committed adultery. He still murdered people. He still lied. Except, he still broke right. almost every command that God gave him as far as being a king. And yet, because God is a merciful and kind God. He broke every, isn't that a little contrary to the scripture? Uh, every, every, every command is referring to being a king. Okay. So do we have any text in the book that says Abraham committed adultery? No. Do adulterers? Okay, no is the answer to that. So you want to read into the text adultery on it Abraham, even though either. God said, it, it, even though God said he he well, well technically he told a half truth. Uh, Sarah was his half sister. Which is a full lie. Again, that's that's a, that's a that's another that's another issue. Um, let's not get off track here. So in the case of David as well, it Do specifically take, take said. It, it specifically no. says that he, he he obeyed everything except for in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, right? Yeah. So it didn't say Abraham obeyed all of my commands, all of my decrees, yeah. all of my laws, except for that Hagar situation. Does yeah, it? I'll answer. If you think that that text means that Abraham never sinned and there aren't things that were in Abraham's life that were sinful, uh, then I think you're reading too much into that text okay right? so this, this, i agree with you hold on, I agree hold, with on, you. hold on a moment the text is speaking overall to mm -hmm. abraham being a man of faith who pleased god it does not necessitate nor does it lead to nor does it explain is it intended to explicitly say that there were no commands no laws no sins that abraham committed over time throughout his life okay so yep. where where in scripture can you show me that it is adultery for a man to take more than one wife. Well, Mike, well, let, me you, this, Mike, let me let me answer this real quick, Mike. It's the right. same place. It's the same place that you can find that abortion is murder, or that doing drugs is wrong. It's the exact same place. Right next to it. it, it, it it's right there. It's that exactly the called, same. It's called it's called common sense and God's law written on our hearts. No. Okay, so 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 <laughs> you want me to believe that. Okay, lying is a sin, right? There, we, we will all agree that there's little sins and there's big sins and there's medium sins. It's all sins and it all keeps us apart from God. However, adultery is a rather big sin. Do we all agree with that? Yes. Punishable by death. It's, it's, a, it's a very serious sin to God, is it not? Yeah. yeah so right. you want us to believe that Abraham committed adultery, that David committed adultery 17 times or so before he ever was rebuked for it, and all through scripture and all of these examples of men with multiple wives committing flagrant and unrepentant adultery, one of the biggest, most, most damaging things to the, such a, a wonderful institution of marriage that God created, but God was simply silent on the matter. He never said, Abraham, why'd you commit adultery? He didn't say, David, with those 17 other women prior to the one where you actually committed adultery, why did you do that? No, he didn't say a word about it because it's not adultery for a man to take a second wife. It's never described that way, and it's never been described that way. If it were, we would have a law. As serious as God is about adultery for a woman, he gave us multiple laws, very specific laws that can show. We, can we answer here's, this, can we answer here, this question? Here that's, is that's a long the, question. here. Okay. Here is what a woman can and cannot do. And if she does, here's the consequences. So what are the consequences for the man if he takes a second wife? No, I'm going to go back to that question. That was a really long question about why it is that God has not directly rebuked uh, these prophets and the answer is God can do as he pleases the question isn't God if God wants to reveal the way he does he, he can do that I mean, why is it that drugs have been done by humanity for thousands of years all the time? And yet God does not directly prohibit the doing of drugs God can do as he pleases Why is it that man has been killing their children for thousands and thousands of years? And yet God never directly says thou shalt not commit abortion. It's because God can do as he pleases It's not my job to question why God reveals what he does or what he does not do the fact is when we have the fullness of revelation especially in the new testament in matthew 19 which tells us that if a man takes on another woman while he is still married even if he considers that marriage that is adultery that is my job is to understand that passage and apply it to the situation and not my job to go and correct god and say god you should have done this you should have done that okay if, if i may for just a second sure um first corinthians chapter six verses 9 through 11 it says or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers and then it goes on with a list of other things will inherit the kingdom of god yeshua said that many will come from the east and the west and will recline at the table in the kingdom of heaven with abraham isaac and jacob 
I, uh, adulterers do not inherit the kingdom, but we know that Abraham and Jacob will be there. Reconcile those for me. Make that make sense. You want to take that, Mike? You want me to do it? Uh, 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 again, sure. Again, uh, if there, there are a lot of things. <clears throat> well, let me just say this. Nobody gets into heaven outside of the righteousness of Christ. So let's make that clear. None of us are saved by our works. When Paul is speaking to the character of an individual who continual in continual practice of these ungodly sins, denoting that these perhaps are not even genuine believers. And so what Paul is encouraging the church to do is to remain faithful to God in his lifestyle. And we should not practice homosexuality, adultery, idolatry, or any of these other sins that he communicates in first Corinthians uh, chapter number seven, Right. So the, these are encouragements for the believers to live a holy lifestyle, but to impose that you're going to get in or I'm going to get in without the righteousness of Christ, I think is reading too much into the text. So, so to take a sinful man, right, like David, who was an adulterer and show that he I believe David will be in heaven. Right. Just like I'm going to be in heaven. Right. And so the fact that David committed adultery is in no way evidence that he will not be in heaven. So I, I think that's when, a fallacy to make that assumption. Okay, so back to what Bible marriages said. Jacob was a was a flagrant, regular, ongoing adulterer, producing all of the sons that led to the nation of Israel, and God said nothing, zero, zilch, nada. Yeah, neither. But, but he called him out for other things. Really? Neither did he really say. Neither did he say a single word about divorcing your wife when Moses gave them the command. But it wasn't until the New Testament that Jesus Christ yeah. makes it clear that from the beginning it was not so. Well, again, you're the one arguing from silence again because what you because as no, uh, Pastor no, JD no. points out, as Pastor AG points out. Uh, you, you want us to go in and correct where God should have corrected man, right? But we can find all throughout scripture, certain things happening and God not necessarily, uh, not necessarily correcting it at that time. That in no yeah. way justifies it or makes it not sinful. It, it The thing is, is you have no command anywhere naming it as sinful. You've made up, you have, you actually use a very modern definition of adultery because adultery wasn't even, uh, wasn't even defined. If you go back and look at the Moorish Bible dictionary, from 150 years ago, it specifically says that adultery is uh, when a married woman has relations with a man who wow. is not her husband. Well, Paul actually because, puts it in the category of pornea in First Corinthians chapter number yeah. seven when he says, "Let every woman have her own husband." So Paul actually puts it in the category of sexual immorality. So I think there's clear scripture that makes this simple. Yep. Hey, I want to mention something real quick. We are going to do Q and A. But there's a lot of questions coming through. A couple people have dropped super chats in for like. 299 499 so if anybody does have a good question that you want to ask we'll, we'll definitely look at the super chats first we'll make it 499 you know five dollar questions uh for and we'll, we'll give it to the guys to give to your favorite charity um well i want to bring this one question that bible marriage has asked because we got kind of got lost there uh it says what are the consequences for a man who takes a second wife what what does that mean what was that question what do you mean what are the consequences for are you talking about is it, what is the consequences like before God? Is that what the question is being asked? In in scripture, we see that uh, that specific sins have specific uh, specific prices, whether it's being stoned or whether it's bringing a lamb to the temple or whatever. You know, in in the law, we see specific prices. What's the specific price for um, taking a second wife? Yeah, I, I think that the, the, the other thing that needs to be taken into consideration is to sin against more light is a greater sin. And so since God did not reveal as clearly uh, in, in the Old Testament uh, the sinfulness of this reality, then it's much more sinful today with the fullness of God's revelation, with the fullness of Christ's teaching and all of the scriptures. Uh, and then to sin against that is it, certainly um, you know, much more much more heinous. But to me, if someone today decided that they were going to uh, have a living girlfriend that they decided they were going to perpetually uh, take care of and then uh, went to some hobo, you know, some fake a ceremony and claim that's marriage, I would say they're committing perpetual adultery and they should be uh, called out upon it and they should repent. Uh, and if they refuse, they should be excommunicated from God's church. Absolutely. So, so you just said that if they had a girlfriend that they were living with, mm -hmm. just one, yep. they're committing adultery? No, I was saying, I was uh, speaking in the context of a married man who decides that his living, he's going to have a living girlfriend. 
No, what we were asking is a married man who takes another wife. Yes, I, I would not, consider that perpetual adultery. A... I, I would say that okay. no differently. It was, it was, I would say that's perpetual adultery and the person needs to repent. But There's, you can't, but, but, but to Go be ahead. clear, you can't point to a single Torah command anywhere in scripture or any, actually any command in scripture that actually Nothing says a man, hold on, that actually says a man taking a second wife is guilty of adultery. Now, Maybe what you're using is a, a passage on divorce, which I would argue you're applying the adultery in that passage in Matthew 19 to the wrong marriage in the first place. Um, and, and that's where all your error stems from. However, again, we're talking about keeping two wives. We're not talking about divorcing one to take another. So my question simply remains, where can we point to in scripture to tell a man you cannot take a second wife because it's adultery? No, my, my, answer, my, answer, that continue, that my answer continues. It's the same. My answer continues to be the same. That if a man, according to the logic of of the clarity of Jesus' words in Matthew nineteen, that if a man uh, marries someone while his while he's still in God's sight, married to another person, then the sexual act there is considered adultery. So that would absolutely, in my mind, apply to uh, whether uh, whether you decide to divorce your wife or not. It doesn't matter. And so you, if you're having, and and you're so you believe woman, that you believe that. You believe that Jesus, that God waited until Jesus had a talk with the Pharisees about divorce to instruct us on polygyny when it wasn't being, we weren't talking, they weren't talking about polygyny. He was talking about divorce. And you believe we're supposed to read into that polygyny law when, when by your own argument, divorce is incredibly serious to God, right? Marriage is incredibly serious to God. But still, even in that moment, you want us to believe that God still didn't actually explicitly tell us taking a second wife is adultery. He just wanted us to read his mind and infer from it. What, what, I, what I expect you to believe is you're supposed to know you're not supposed to put surgical instruments into a woman's body and dismember a child in the womb. And yet God has never explicitly told you, even to this day with the New Testament, that you cannot do that. Yes, I expect Thou you to use not your, your, I expect Exactly. I expect to use your common sense and to know mm -hmm. what what life is and what the unlawful killing of human life is, whether or not God says to put, but he gave us a command. command. Let me, let me add he, to that. He real also quick. gave us a command about, about marriage and adultery and God already defined Mary. He didn't wait until the, into the new Testament to tell us about marriage. He told exactly. us right there in the institution, what marriage is, is between no, one no. man and one woman right there in the garden. And, and so we no, agree, he, did not, JD. he did not condemn hey. man for violating that law explicitly, but that doesn't change the fact that he never, permitted and he never told you to do this he defined marriage and people have always gone beyond god's law and broken women's heart in the process because of their own carnal lust yes i believe that okay so what god did in genesis was define what a marriage is we all agree on that right a, a, a marriage, marriage. No, no, not what a marriage is what marriage is no what god did was describe what a marriage is he no, it literally no. was descriptive he said what a marriage is and he told us in what it's not, right? He did well. He didn't tell us a marriage is between a man and a man. I think we can all agree on that. No, he no, he no. You know, based on that same logic, you can say, argue that same thing. That is just descriptive. So he didn't say that two men cannot marry, two women cannot marry, or two. No, 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 no. Hold on, JD, hold on. He, I would argue, yes, you're right, but that's why we use the whole counsel of Scripture and not just mm -hmm. Genesis two twenty four. But what y'all are trying to do now is go back to Genesis two twenty four and argue that's everything. While we ignore the rest of Scripture no, no, showing no. that a man can have, I'm not done, while showing that a man can have more than one marriage, we agree a marriage is between one man and one woman who become one flesh. What we, what we don't agree on here is how many marriages a man can have at one time and how many marriages a woman can have at one time. I'm, I'm, hold on. I see you shaking your head, Mike. Just give you a chance. Okay. <laughs> The rest of scripture, the whole council of scripture shows us that a man can have more than one marriage at a time, while it explicitly shows us that a woman cannot have more than one marriage at a time. And it tells us that she is an adulteress and she's to put, be put to death if she does. So if it was equally as important as you guys are arguing, why is the punishment not death for the man? Uh, again, you're imposing on the text, uh, arguing from silence. Again, as Pastor J.D. clearly pointed out, God established biblical marriage from the beginning when he says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto mm -hmm. his wife. And let's finish the verse because I think it's important. And they too shall be one 
flesh. That's mm -hmm. biblical. He wasn't just saying, hey, let me give you an example of a marriage. But, you know, you guys can come up with some different types if you want. No. Yeah. And again, it's okay, so. Wait, and, 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 I, one, and I, one other thing, Mike, he also says in Malachi, why has God alluding back to Genesis? Why has God brought the two, the one into two? Why has exactly. he brought the two together to produce godly offspring? So the reality is no one ever should have trans gone beyond God's instruction. No one. God never said. And oh, by the way, you can marry multiple people. He never and, said that. And Jesus takes them where back to the beginning when Paul has to deal with when it comes to uh, when it comes to a man and, and women in relationship as it pertains to leadership and even in ministry. What does he do? He says he takes them back to the creation account. Why? Because that is where the biblical relationship between a man and a woman was established. This was not just a suggestion. This was not just, hey, here's a type of marriage that you can have. No, this is biblical marriage. And God takes us to the beginning to help us understand that the reason jesus pulls that up is he's he is pulling it up in a divorce passage or a discussion about divorce and he's demonstrating the indissolubility of marriage and again we agree a man and a woman equals a marriage but scripture nowhere ever requires that a man only be allowed one marriage we see example after example after example of You're men that had more than one yeah. They're not all bad. And that's a fallacious argument, JD. I've already illustrated to you that earlier. They're not all bad. There's 40 plus examples that are named. And we and we have to know that. The, the, and we all would I assume we all would agree that when people are named in scripture, it's because there's a purpose for naming them. There's a purpose for lineage. So we have to believe that, yes, even though Lamech was the first named polygynist, it's more than likely there were many more outside of him. And all along history, there's many more. We knew that the Jews were polygynous all throughout their history. There is There are thousands, maybe millions of examples of, of polygynous families that we've never heard that, 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 that we've never heard of and we don't have the stories of. So it's a fallacious argument to say they're all bad examples because you don't have the information to make that assessment. No. OK, let me let me respond to that. The Bible says that these things are written for our example. So the Bible gives us both positive and negative examples that we're supposed to draw things from. We're supposed to see Elijah's faith and we're supposed to imitate Elijah's faith. We're supposed to see Naaman's faith and do that. Likewise, we're supposed to see bad examples and to see the outcome of their lives and not to follow them. So I do think that it's not fallacious at all to say that God has revealed in scripture the result of poly uh, polygamy. It comes from a rotten fruit. It produces rotten fruit. It produces death and destruction. Every single example is nothing but pure misery and hell on what? earth for the people involved. And there's not a single counterexample. The best that you have is th the case of where no information is found so that's all you have that's maybe not true. in the cases where we have nothing about their marriages maybe that was a good marriage that's the only thing you have that's not true no that's completely false I i'm still waiting for the good example you, you don't need a good example what you need is I a law i said there's no good examples you said it was false i said you, where's my good example with respect can, how many good examples of monogamous marriages do you have you gave one that i remember i said i said rebecca and isaac i said joseph and, and uh, we saw and Jacob and Mary, Zachariah and Elizabeth, Zachariah and Elizabeth. And, and so in all of those examples, if I go to the scripture, there's there's no conflict whatsoever. There's, I'm not going to find anything. Good marriage does not mean no conflict. It means OK, not so we death, agree. Misery, and destruction. We agree. So okay. I can like I said, I can point we have a billion, maybe not billion, but we have multi million dollar Christian marriage counseling industry because of how much trouble comes from Christian marriages. Right. So monogamy what doesn't actually okay, no, but my monogamy on its face, monogamy on its face does not equal good marriage, right? Monogamy is a good institution that centers can corrupt. Yes. Okay, so is monogamy different than polygyny? Yes, polygyny no, is, a, is, a, is an unlawful marriage. institution. No, that is that no, no, no. You, hold on, you said it's an unlawful institution, but you can't point to any single law that says you can't do it. It's Where the same law that forbids that abortion. It's the same law that forbids abortion. It's the law no, it's to not. not commit adultery. Exactly. You haven't proven that it's adultery. Well, yeah. well did abortion that's, that's exist? Like the abortion is saying I haven't proven that it's murder. The fact that you don't agree that it's murder hey, doesn't change the fact that it is that. murder. The fact that you don't agree that it's adultery doesn't change the fact that it is adultery. To have yeah. sex with someone other than your wife, if you ask anybody. Can God command a man? Can God command people, a man? Okay. Can God command a man to commit adultery? No. Okay, so the Exodus 21 10 says if he takes to himself another woman, he has to have sex with her. But sex with what another is woman it, what is adultery. What, what Exodus 21 10. 2010. 21 10. 21 10, yeah. Okay. 
I'm going to go ahead and share the screen real quick so y'all can see it. I mean, this is just okay. clearly yeah, an example so this of is the regulation that was already said. Go ahead. Go ahead, J.D. No, that's exactly right. What what this is doing is this is regulating an evil institution and making that institution less evil. And so, in the case exactly. of, of less this, what he's saying is, if you have, or if you're already, if you're already married to this other woman, then you cannot simply neglect her. That you have to take care of her. You can't just, uh, you can't just mistreat her in that way. Yeah, this so, is to protect so, women. So it's, so it's less sinful to commit perpetual adultery, as you call it. Yes, life is messy. I would say this even today. If a man is already married, if, if a man is already married to multiple women, uh, and yet they have children together and all these kind of things, then you you are in a messy situation where it to simply break off the marriages and, and destroy the whole thing is in fact messy. It's it's exactly like in Matthew 19, where it says that if a if a man marries another woman, he's committing adultery. But almost all Christians oh. agree that does not mean he divorces the second wife. That when means do you that he asked God for forgiveness. Right, so life is messy, and sometimes you do have to continue on an okay. evil institution, like slavery was an evil institution, that sometimes that you had to continue on for a time being until you could properly release the slaves. And so just like the Christian logic destroyed slavery, the Christian logic historically destroyed polygamy in the first place. But in cases where polygamy is still there, it does need regulation, and these things are helpful so that women don't get hurt. Okay. Just like divorce. So when do you think the when when do you think the definition of adultery uh, as a biblical like as a consensus among Christians changed to what you're saying? It never when changed. Did, <laughs> okay, so so if there's a Bible dictionary, if Easton's Bible dictionary at some point said adultery is they defined it differently than you. Um, I define it by if, God's if, law. You you define, define it by, by God's, God's law. law. That's right. But but not by God's law, by inference. All all that God has revealed in the Scripture. Okay, both, so God gave God gave his people. All right, JD, let, hear me out. God gave his people. Well, what is it? Six hundred and thirteen laws, right? Right, Pete. Yeah, more or less. Okay, more or less. Six hundred and thirteen laws, and and the reason he gave those is is to set his people apart. Right? It's to yeah. say, stop doing what the nations around you are doing. They're wicked. They're abominable. They've been doing all these things for so long. I don't want you to do these things anymore. And some of those laws are very, very detailed. Right. Like mm -hmm. there's there's a law about putting a parapet around your roof so that, you know, someone doesn't fall off and, and, and die to protect life. You want us to believe that the God who cares about marriage as much as we all agree that he does. You want us to believe that he didn't have the foresight. He didn't have the knowledge. He didn't have that. He didn't see that this debate was going to happen. He didn't see and say, you know what? Within those, let's make it 614. Let's make it 614 and let's add a law that says no longer will men take more than one wife like the nations around you because it's wicked. It's abominable. And as you said, J.D., it's from bad. Uh, it's a bad root. I don't want my people practicing this anymore. Yeah, my answer to that is Matthew 19, that for the hardness of man's heart, God permitted it. God in his wisdom knew that to regulate the evil was a better good than simply to abolish it and no one to listen to it at all and everyone to get hurt. It's like the exact same argument for slavery. That's not, but, God, but, but God that's never not what he said, said J.D. That's not what he said. said. One second, let me finish. God never says it is always evil all the time to have slaves. And yet the Christian logic worked out about the Imago Dei and human beings recognize that it is, in fact, evil to own people. That is, in fact, a great evil. You can find people throughout the Bible doing that. But as the fullness of revelation comes, people finally get that full picture. And yet God, during the Old Testament training wheels, regulates evil. And then as more revelation come, people come to see this is, in fact, an evil institution that we should abandon. And we have abandoned that. By the way, my argument is what, what has actually happened. Christians have abandoned the institution of slavery. Christians have abandoned, besides you, has abandoned the institution of polygamy that produces death, misery, and pain on women and children. It's evil, it's terrible, and it has been abolished. Why do, uh, you mentioned about abortion. You said, you know, God didn't mention it, but then you said, he, you know, he regulated, he regulated, um, polygyny. why didn't I'm he regulate sorry. abortion and say, well, cause if they were going to do it, why not just, you know, make it, make it less evil. He did so, regulate. He did regulate miscarriages. He did tell you. Though. Abortions of why intentional life, right? Because God can do as he pleases. My job is not to question God. My God, my job is to understand what God says. Why didn't God regulate uh, abortion in a more specific way, you got to ask that him. That's not my job. My okay. job is to understand what God has said and to apply it. And, and again, the Christian church has spoken unanimously about this. Abortion is murder. It is evil. 
I Nobody agree. goes around arguing that, oh, because God was less clear in the Old Testament, therefore we can kill babies. It, it's completely no, I'm just saying that the same water. argument should apply that you're like, you said he regulated polygyny because people were already going to do it. And he just said, well, let's just, if since they're already going to do it, and then rather than them not listen at all and forbid it, then let's just go ahead and regulate it. Well, then no. what people are going to do. So, he knew people were going to do abortion too. I gotta, Why didn't he regulate that? They, he did, they were he actually doing. They were actually doing it uh, in the day that he regulated it, right? And and that's why you see the regulation being put in the law. Why? Because the evil, wicked hearts of men had already instituted these practices at an enormous rate. Therefore, it was a great necessity hey, at the time of the law that right, God is, decided to regulate it. This, this is that, our time, right? Can't, yes. Can't question. You, got, okay. you got about 16 minutes. I got a question. Second Chronicles 24. Can we pull it up? Sure. Let me get that for you. Give me one second. What was it? Second Chronicles 24? Yes, sir. Okay. The, the whole chapter? Second Chronicles 24, 2, it says, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada took for him two wives, and he became the father of sons and daughters. If it's right in the sight of the Lord, now I would I think we would all agree that Yeshua is 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 God and he was there from the beginning. And uh so when it says that God saw Joash take two wives. And he said it was right in his sight. It was Yeshua saying that, right? So if it's right in his sight, how can you guys make the claim that it's wrong in his sight? Mike, why don't you answer that? Sure. Again, you, you can't take statements like uh, David did that which was right in his sight. Hezekiah did that which was right in his sight. All right. God speaks this uh, in an overall way, but it doesn't. No, no, no. This is one sentence later. This is not it like talking matter. about his whole life. This is talking. This is literally one it, sentence it, it, later. It, it, it says it, it could have been in the same sentence. It doesn't matter. Okay. The statement itself right. does not preclude that there were no sins in the person's life or that the person had not failed or there was nothing they did that was wrong. Again, that's an assumption that you're. But it's just as much an assumption for you to say it's wrong in his sight but he's saying it's right now, this, in isn't his sight. this isn't the verse that we use to prove that it's wrong yeah we Mike, let, me jump, let me jump in real quick Mike. Let, me, let, let, let me let me make let a quick let me, let me let me let me answer this is that our time jd hold on go ahead, hold go, on. Ahead, go, ahead, go ahead mike um you you said that it is a general statement did what was right in the sight of the lord but actually it's a very specific statement right there and i can prove it because later on after jehoiada the priest dies we see that um, uh, that uh, Joash did things that he wasn't supposed to, and he mm -hmm. was condemned by the Most High. Absolutely. But that statement specifically said he did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So during the time of the life of Jehoiada, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and it very clearly is connected with Jehoiada gave him two wives, and they bore him sons and daughters. You cannot deny that fact. Well, and, and okay. furthermore, I, I'll say, I'll point say, point just point so point we point. can, we just since wait, Jehoiada wait, wait, was the can one. I, can, I answer, can I answer this this question? Well, I was just going to follow up and just right finish ahead. what he said. Verse fifteen and Go sixteen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Since Jehoiada was the one who gave him the wives, clearly, okay, and Jehoiada, Jehoiada would have known the law. All right, mm -hmm. he was a priest. Further on, when it says they buried Jehoiada in the city of David among the kings because he had done well in Israel and to God and to his house. So he was buried in high honor uh, as, as a priest. So, again, you guys want us to believe that the text is telling us Jehoiada, the priest who knew the law, gave Joash two wives. The Lord is telling us everything jo Jehoiada did that Joash did while Jehoiada was alive, including giving him two wives and having sex with both of them and bearing children through them. He's telling us it's right in his sight, but you guys want us to believe it's wrong. All right. So let me answer right. this. So I, I agree. I agree with Pastor Mike. Uh, what he said. The, the fact is, this is a generalized statement. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of this priest. That's a generalized statement. Is that saying he never lied? Is that saying he never stolen? Is that saying he never coveted? Is that saying he honored his father and mother perfectly? Of course not. That's absurd. Nobody believes that unless you believe in sinless perfection. That's a generalized statement saying, in general, he was a godly man, or at least he appeared to be a godly man during his life. The contrast of what happens after he dies is he goes into all kinds of gross immorality and sin. So, again, this. So it was right what he did. Sex is not. Not saying to, to nope, we're not. That, is that just me or is are we losing TV? No, no, it's do you write incident, right? Was that really true? Did didn't he do a census? Didn't he ever lie? Didn't he ever cover? Didn't he 
field? Didn't he ever? Again, it's a general statement. And take a July statement and then think that means everything else he did was perfectly acceptable in God's sight is just a completely fallacious argument. Well, I would disagree. I think it's. I think you guys are you you guys are just diminishing the obvious, which is this statement is literally right after that, and it's not the only <laughs> statement. Here's the other thing, David. You know, David had multiple wives when he wrote Psalm 18. And, and David's in, in Psalm 18 saying, I'm blameless before the Lord. I've kept his ordinances. I've kept his statutes. My hands are clean. Okay. So are, are you want me to believe that David's writing a Psalm while having multiple wives saying his hands are clean. He's kept all of his laws. He's kept all of his statutes. He's blameless in the sight of the Lord. Okay. Yes, it, yeah. which, which further in scripture God tells us, in fact, he confirms that. He says he did everything I asked of him except for the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So he's got three or four wives. He's writing Psalm 18. He's saying, I'm blameless. My hands are clean. I've, I've done everything the Lord has asked, all of his commandments, all of his statutes include. But but you want me to believe somehow, some way, David, God, all of these great patriarchs, all of these men who had the law, who spoke with God, who walked with God, who wrestled with God. You want us to believe God simply just forgot to mention the multiple wives thing is a problem. <laughs> that they were adulterers. Yes, yeah. you're committing adultery. Because all the same time, at all the same time, throughout all of this, God is talking about adultery, right? God hates adultery, right? But uh, you again, want us to you're, believe. You're imposing that on he, the text from general I, I, statements I'm of not God. imposing on the text. The hold on, hold on. Let me finish my statement. Let me finish my statement. You, right? You're imposing on the text when the scripture, because then the scripture says this about many men. If you think this means David was in a state of sinless perfection, you have read too much into the text. Yep. If, if you yep. think that this means David never you lied, David never sinned, no. David never fornicated, David never committed adultery, David never murdered, right? David never sinned in any way, David never lusted, th right. then you're reading too much into the text. And so, again, you're taking mm -hmm. generalized statements and trying to uh, approve something that is clearly, uh, I think, pointed out in scripture to be sinful. And you just, and you're doing that based on a generalized yeah. statement that so, does not prove that David. Yeah. Had no I, I, I think I'd also I think I'd also add, uh, Mike, that I think that as far as uh, a lot of these men, uh, we are we often have blind spots, right? We often can we can't see our own sin, uh, and we and we're, we're ignorant of it because it's culturally acceptable. So a lot right. of women, as an example, think that they're modest when they're half naked today. I mean, that's just the truth. A lot of a lot of men think that they're modest when they're half naked as well, okay. uh, walking around so, with no shirts and their muscles. When, when David committed yeah. adultery, did God did God send somebody to rebuke him for it? Yes. Right. But he didn't send anybody for the years and years and years and years. The 17 it. wives that he had prior to that, all the children, all the sex, let me, all let me that. God just well, didn't well, see. You know, it. And, what's, and, interesting, and also, what's, interesting about, what's interesting about that is God explicitly says that a king is not to multiply wives. Right. Yes. Yeah, so what does that mean? Multiplied JD? wives. And yet God never directly uh, condemned him for that. Are we then to conclude that David didn't multiply wives? Solomon. No, he had I don't think that he thousands. Did. He had. If anyone ever multiplied wives, it was Solomon. When did God send Nathan or Nathan-like prophet to say, "Thou art the man. You have multiplied wives. You've multiplied horses. You multiplied all these things." That isn't what God did. The way that God revealed that Solomon's folly and sin is by using Solomon as a as a bad example. God and says what was this is right. What I agree with you, JD. Exactly what happened in I agree with you, JD. So let me just ask you one question. Go ahead. Should we go around to Christians who have more than one horse and tell them they're sinning? No. Why not? Because the Bible doesn't forbid more than one horse. It says, "Do not multiply horses." Right. It's talking about it, it's in the context of a king trusting in military might. OK, exactly. but so but so it's in the context of the king for the horses. It's in the context for the king for the gold and silver, but it's not in the context for the king for but, the wives. But that, wasn't, but that really wasn't my point. My point is, is that David and Solomon clearly violated God's law in Torah. Are and you sure that God David does did? not yet well, all those same statements about David being a, a man after God's own heart and all these other statements are still true of him. And God never sent Nathan to come rebuke him about that. And that counters your argument that th this couldn't have been said because God must rebuke a person for doing blatant. No, 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 uh, I didn't say no, no, no. You're mischaracterizing my position. I did not say you, you that agreed God it, must. Solomon. You agree that Solomon multiply wise, right? And so uh, let's, I let's agree that it out. I, I believe I, you agree that Solomon multiply wise. I, okay, I, 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 I believe I, you agree it's that it's our time, Master Mike. Hold on. 
Well, I'm answering your question though, right? I, I agree. No, that no, no. Solomon I was adding on to what JD said. Okay. So, so Solomon multiplied wives. There was no, there was no Nathan coming to rebuke Solomon for multiplying wives. Again, you're because something is not in the text. You're taking narratives and trying to make them normative, and that doesn't work. You can't Scripture, do that. Scripture actually tells us what Solomon's sin was, and it wasn't the number of wives that he had. Now, I will agree that it was excessive. But scripture tells us what his sin was. Now, what was his sin? Because scripture tells us it's explicit. Mm -hmm. It says because he took foreign wives and they led his heart astray. And that is in the I, text I actually matches perfectly with the reasoning why he doesn't want them multiplying wives. When when Solomon is being described, it says he took these foreign wives who led his heart from God. And in fact, even when it's being spoken about, and, and he's saying, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. And it says his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord, his God. It did not say his heart was not devoted wholly to his first wife. It said his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord, his God. And then it even says, as the heart of his father okay, okay, David I think, I think, had I been. Missed, so, I think you're missing the point of that, why we brought that up. The point was, is that your argument was that if these men were sinning, then God would. No, no, no. I understand your argument, J.D. I don't want to. We don't have a lot right. of time. I understand right. what you're saying. You, I didn't say that a, a God must send a prophet to rebuke them. I was making the point in David's case that he very specifically sent a prophet to rebuke adultery. Your position is that adultery is a man having sex with anything more than his first wife. I'm yeah. simply saying that God sent David a prophet specifically to rebuke adultery. Okay. When he let committed me, let, adultery, let me, which me, was taking okay, another okay, man's wife. Okay, a good point. So let me respond to that. My position is, in fact, that it is adultery. I know other people that would say that, no, this is a another type of lesser sexual sin. And even if that is the case, even if it is the case that it's not strictly adultery, that it's some lesser sexual sin, the point is it's still it's still sin. It's still something that we should, should not do and ought not do, and is a violation of God's law. So where is the command that, that identifies this lesser sexual sin. What is the commandment? Well, okay. I would say, you know, in, in this kind of, this is, is interesting because I think you said that a man can only commit adultery if he's had sex with a married woman. And so this is why it seemed like you were stumbling I, I, over I whether you could have that. sexual Scripture prostitute. Says that. Leviticus chapter 20 okay. verse. That's, 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 yes. Not, so, that's so, his word, not mine. Okay. So this reminds me very much of someone that I heard, a false teacher on the internet that said, based on that logic, then you can only commit adultery in your heart if you lust after a woman who is in fact married. And this was a this was a snake trying to justify watching pornography and lusting after women. And it just it just it just JD, that might have been his intent, but he was absolutely right about the interpretation of that okay. passage. But but the reality is that okay. God, God the reality is that Christ teaches us that the central sin of sexual immorality is lust, which is to exactly. get sexual gratification from someone other than your wife. See, that's what Yahweh does. Christ, Yahweh JD. teaches us. Where does that, where, what God verse are you talking about? Right there when Jesus that says that you that. heard Matthew chapter seven, when Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in your heart. That's what Yahweh right, right, teaches right. us about okay, the spirit hold on, of pause, the law. Go ahead. Pause, let him JD. finish. Let him finish. Well, we're short that's, on time, so I want to make sure we get to point. it. We got three and a half Yahweh minutes. Yahweh teaches okay. us the spirit yes, of the yes. law. Go ahead. It, okay. He teaches us the spirit of the law, but the context yeah. of the law is you shall not commit adultery. Adultery, as we know it, is taking another man's wife. So you have to stay in context. Jesus is saying, you shall not take another man's wife, but I say to you, you've heard it said, don't have sex with another man's wife. But I say to you, any man, and guess what? We already have a Torah law that tells us not to do this. How wonderful is that? Jesus is appealing to the Torah. He says, I say to you, any man who covets his neighbor's wife has already committed that adultery in his heart. If you look at the Greek and you actually study it out, you will see that he is not talking yeah. about any woman. And the problem with that, J.D., because if you believe that, that means that any single man, okay, yeah. who covets a wife, who, who has sexual desire for a wife and looks upon her to covet or lust after her or desire her or however yeah. you want to translate it, he's committing adultery in his heart. That's right. So you believe that. See, this, is, this is the difference. I believe that true Christians 
we love God's word. We don't try to get around God's word. We internalize God's word and we see what God is saying. And God is telling us that sexual desires all throughout the Bible are supposed to be gratified through marriage. The legalist and the pervert says that I'm going to find all these ways to wiggle around God's word so that I can satisfy Why my do you have to use that hominem attack to uh, argue that, your that's point? That's the difference. That's the difference. Why the do you have to use is, ad hominem attacks to argue your point instead of just it, that applies to you, it applies to you. I'm not saying it applies to you, but if well, that applies to you, that, that it, no, it, doesn't it doesn't apply to me, but I'm, I'm trying to illustrate to you that if you could just stick to the scriptures, not use words like pervert, not appeal to emotions like you guys have been doing for this entire debate, we can uh -huh. just stick to the scriptures and show what the scriptures actually say. We don't need to get, we don't need to get, you know, uh, okay. the character of other people are talking about the motivation. Listen, of other people. Sure, your, your questions are a whole lot longer than you all allow us to answer. Let's make that clear. If we go back and return, I get to your questions are probably 70% of the time. And when we answer, you interrupt us. So is it our, is it our time? It is your time. Okay. So if, if we've, it's if, our time to answer. Okay. Well, if we feel like the question has been sufficiently answered, we can ask another question. We're running short on time. Okay. Okay. So did Jesus lust? Did Jesus lust? Absolutely not. Jesus never lusted so, after so, any woman. So the same word that Jesus uses to say, I've, I've, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal gets translated as co uh, coveting or lust mm -hmm. or other same things. Word. It's the same, same word, word, right? Bro, it's not, it's you, not about you all the know about that words take on meaning in the context, right? You're, again, bro, right? So I'm, I'm just asking you, can, is, is the, lust same word or is does coveting? Mean, does not I mean, just hear me out. Have is, lust, is lust, is lust or coveting, is lust or coveting inherently sinful? Again, in the context that JD was pointing out, of a man lusting after a woman is okay. sinful. To, All right. to, but but okay. there's a context in which the word can be used that is not sinful, which is mm -hmm. clear when you talk about Christ. I totally agree. So let me ask you this, Pastor Mike. You're, you're married? Yes, 29 years. One you, uh, JD, you're married. Do you both sexually desire your own wife? No, Mike, I got to answer this one. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you better say yes. You all better say yes. Absolutely. I hope so. My wife is amazing. Okay. So yeah. if you both look upon your wife with sexual desire or lust or anything, are you committing adultery in your heart? Because it says any no. man, that includes you. Oh my God. It, inclu <laughs> it includes you, right? But, 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 friend, 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 you cannot commit adultery. Neither can exactly. you lust. Because the marriage bed is undefiled. And, and that's really exactly. the point. You just now, if, I'm a, JD. If, I'm, if I'm a married man and my sexual desires are supposed to be pleased through my, my wife, 1 Corinthians 7, then any desire to satisfy that sexual desire with another woman, pornography, right. lust, flirting with other women, trying to get other women to marry me online, all of that is a violation of the law of lust. My wife is supposed to be where I receive my sexual satisfaction satisfaction and by the way there's not this one way thing that you guys are saying my wife also is supposed to receive sexual gratification from me not from other men not from that. romance novels not from from hollywood movies and actors or anything like that i'm supposed I, to receive think, my sexual gratification from her she's supposed to receive her sexual gratification from me that is the I, biblical I, ethic of Bible marriage is good your time's up but go ahead and say your last I, thought i think we would all agree on that i think the only distinction would be that we would simply say that sexual desire as paul would say if you if, if you have sexual desire that's too hard to control that it sex is supposed to be within marriage so a sexual desire from a man say jacob's case his desire should be for a wife either he, whether he has one wife whether he has two three or four but 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 the Bible tells the wife her sexual desire is only supposed to be to that one husband because a man, a, a woman can only have one master. A woman can only have one head. Okay, guys, we're going to open it up to some questions. The first ones we're going to ask uh, will be anybody that uh, puts a super chat of any amount will ask your question first. I have one question that I wanted to ask to open it up and we'll uh, we're just going to throw this out to both sides. Okay, in your estimate, this we're going to do this for about 15 minutes, actually. Let me go ahead and set the timer. And then we're going to do closing statements. We're going to give each side uh, five minutes, max five minutes to uh, shut it down. All right. In your estimation, which system, our current monogamy only model, or the allowance of polygyny hurts women the most? In Who do you estimation? want to answer this first? Either. Why don't we let Everybody. them answer? And then we can okay. follow up. Okay. In your estimation, which 
which system hurts mar- uh, women the most? Well, per- I, I, it's my estimation that the monogamy only system has been incredibly destructive. Um, I would say that based on the last time I ran the numbers, there are some 20 plus million more Christian women in America than there are men. And we have no answers for them. We have no answers other than I'm going to pray. We're going to pray and we're going to pray and we're going to hope God brings you a man. Even though the numbers say it is it is actually impossible for that to happen. Not only that, but men are dropping from the church in America at a much faster rate than women. So the problem is just getting exacerbated and we don't have any answers for them. But God has an answer and he always has had an answer. So my point simply is it's far more destructive to take away to take away an option God has given to solve a problem like that and force something God never forced, leaving all of these women out, leaving the widows, leaving the fatherless. You want to talk about love. You want to talk about the law of love. I could go, I could, I could go on for hours about all of the scenarios as to why it is far more loving for a man to take in more than one woman than it is for him to abandon them, to him to say, sorry, we don't have any answers for you. When those women, we also tell them, as pastors, you guys would know this, you cannot yoke yourself to an unbeliever. So sure, there's a disparity in men and women, but you also tell those women they can't go outside of the church to get a man. And okay. uh, I, I would add one other real quick point to that is uh, the posi- that the situation with polygyny, if a, if a woman had that option, it opens up options to her so that she's not just fishing the bottom of the barrel for single guys uh, when there's a shortage of them, but instead has the ability to actually find a man that's qualified, a family that she would fit well in, and then be a contributor to that family. Um, and at the same time, it forces men or it causes men, gives them the uh, the impetus to grow and to be able to provide more. Mike, why don't you answer and then I'll follow up. Go ahead. Yeah, of course, uh, pol- uh, uh, monogamous marriage is the best way in polygyny or polygamy. Uh, provides more hurt and damage. And I, and I don't have to take a long time to answer. Again, I think JD said it best when he says, do you really think it's loving to tell a woman who you've been married to, and I've been married for 29 years, I'm about to go have sex with another woman. You quote a stat of uh, women outnumbering men, which is a true stat that never justifies seeing, right? Statistics yeah. will never justify seeing. And I guarantee you, if you ask the great majority of those women, would they be feel loved if they join into a relationship where their husband, who they are supposed to have authority over his body, is sleeping with another woman, woman that those women would tell you the distress. Yeah. I believe if, if we perhaps if we even interview uh, uh, women and their, and their cases for it. We didn't bring those up today, but there are cases where women who have come out of those type of relationship and they talk about the stress and the frustration and the hurt and the pain and the anguish within those relationships. And, and so uh, I think it's absolutely clear. Yeah, no, I, I would just follow. I mean, I mean, I would just say who in their opening statement actually appealed to loving women? Who did it? <laughs> like who, who's part of their argument was built on. Is this the way you would want to treat your wife? Is this the way you want to treat uh, your daughters? Is this the way you want to be treated as a woman? Uh, no. Uh, the reality is if, if you love a woman and, and you care for her, the part of you that wants to have sex with another woman is called sin. It's called evil. Mm. Uh, the, the truth is what what's, 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 what's driving people to argue this is the same thing driving the LGBT movement. It's sexual perversion. It's lust. And people are trying to satisfy uh, and trying to use the Bible to justify it. There's a reason why Muhammad, what did he do? He grabbed a bunch of women. There's a reason why Joseph Smith, what did he do? He grabs a bunch of women. Follow false believers, false teachers. What do they do? They always go after the same thing. They go after money. They go after uh, power and they go after sex. And they always do it. It's always the same old game, and it, it's just it's sinful and wicked, and it's it's really uh it's really not what which what you what you what you should be doing. As far as the, the problem of women, the main problem of women is feminism. I don't have time to get into this, but the main problem of women is feminism. And they would stop trying to uh, become lawyers by the time they're thirty five. Maybe they would find more husbands. For the for those who unfortunately it's too late for them, or blah 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 is reality. First off, singleness isn't the worst thing. We need to give a, a full biblical reality. God glorifies singleness. And if God has providentially put you in singleness, you need to trust God in that. We do need to take care of them and, and to provide for them as a church and, and care for them. But a lot of this is the problem of feminism that destroys women in the first place, putting them in the situation. And I guarantee you the, the solution is not for you to have sex with more women. That is not the solution. Well, I, I think we're taking it back to sex. So they say covering. So, but like, so here's what I think about it. 
you know, Paul instructs the widows under 60 to remarry, right? That's what he says. Yeah. I'm wondering where were all these monogamous single Christian men that were marrying 55 year old widows back then? Cause I don't see it. I don't see it now. And I don't see it then one in three children right now are being raised in fatherless homes in America. That number is expected to double by 2030. 85% of people that are incarcerated come from fatherless homes. What is your solution to fix that problem on a system-wide basis? Because just, you know, going out and being a big brother or a big, you know, big sister to something. That, that, obviously, if that was the solution, it would already be happening. What are we going to do to fix that? Because most, that's, most how, that's women, how society most, collapses. Most women, most women uh, can marry at any time they want to. The reality is most women... And I counsel many of them. Most women have an abundance of men to choose from. The fact is they don't want them. So, I mean, you got you to pick, you pick your poison. Either you don't want those men and you say no, or you lower your standards or decide that you are going to pick one of those men. The solution is not for, for uh, believing married men to start having sex with additional women. That, that is not the solution. Uh, the solution is either uh, remain single or decide to marry someone that you may have, have you know, I'm sorry. Hey, if, if your time is, it's, it's true for all of us. If your time has passed, you might have to settle for less. That's true for men. That's true for women. That's the reality. I agree with you about lowering your standards, but I, I think people accuse me of taking it always back to sex and, and you keep doing that. Not me. I'm, I, this well, this is, is what it is that's about. What, that's, that's what's what already about. happening. No, no. That's what's happening now. If it was just about sex, it's rampant fornication right now. We don't need to get married to have sex. We're not talking about Christian women. Well, I don't Christian, believe, I don't Christian, believe Christian women are ramping Eighty-five percent of single women. Eighty-five well, percent of single women. Are why are we not talking? Yeah. Like this and, conversation and, and, should be centered and focused around Christian women only. We should not be talking about anything outside of that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, let's ask this question. Super chat from the revolting man. Uh, Matthew five twenty-eight. Only lists men desiring women. Is it is it allowed for men to desire men or women to desire whoever they want? Who wants to take that? I, I, I'm happy there, to start you with understand that, that question. I don't, I don't know that I understand. I, I understand the question. If you want me to take it. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the point is, um, at least I'm not sure there's a reference to 528, but, but the point is, this is that legalistic understanding of saying, well, you know, it only says adultery and adultery can only be a married woman. So therefore this says nothing about lusting after single women. And, and I think the point is, okay, so based on this, then does that mean I can lust after gay porn? Does that mean I can lust after men? Does that mean I can do other ver lust after animals? Again, that is a very legalistic, evil way of interpreting the Bible. Rather, we realize that the actual principle is lust and trying to gratis uh, gratify yourself sexually to someone other than your spouse. And all of that is forbidden. So God doesn't have to say, don't go lusting after men. He doesn't have to say that. Is If you understand God's law, then it applies to all of these variety of scenarios. And by the way, that's how we all live. Hopefully no one's going around saying, well, he didn't technically say I couldn't lust after men. It's, it's just a, a very bad way of reading. Or, or the question demonstrates the absurdity of your position by indicating that you don't understand what gune in that context means. It is not a, a virgin. It is not a young woman. This is a married woman or a, or a woman that's already taken, which exactly fits the definition of divorce, uh, uh, of uh, adultery, as we have told you multiple times from Leviticus 20, verse 10. And if I could just jump in real quick, again, I, I agree with you, J.D., we shouldn't be legalistic. We shouldn't go outside of the context of what's being talked about. We shouldn't try to infer all kinds of different things from this. But the context of what Jesus is teaching is, is, is saying, you have heard it that was said, you shall not commit adultery. Right. But I'm going to say to you and, and what he's saying there is I'm going to tell you what's already in the Torah and I'm going to teach you the heart of it. What's already in the Torah is you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. He yes. are, we, there is already a command. Oh. So these so these men were basically you could you could you could imagine these men saying I, and, and I think we're kind of on the same page here. I I think what Jesus was saying there was. Y'all think it's okay to covet your neighbor's wife. You think it's okay for you to be lusting after your neighbor's wife. You think it's okay for you to be looking upon them. I'm telling you, just because you don't actually have sex with them, I'm telling you, and the Torah tells you, because I wrote the Torah, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. So any man that looks upon a woman to covet her has already committed that adultery in his heart. That's what that passage mean. And, and the problem with that passage is it's been misinterpreted by Christians and it's been used to browbeat Christian men for ages over just glancing at a woman and, and being attracted to her because it says 
any man who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her heart, which creates all sorts of theological conflicts and problems because you don't know what adultery actually means. And then it causes all kinds of other problems. So the point is simply don't covet your neighbor's wife. It already says that in the Torah. Let me jump in here that epithomia, and I'm looking at it right now, and Lo and brings this out that this this isn't this isn't just a desire. This is an evil desire. Mm -hmm. Evil desire. Yes, coveting your neighbor's wife is evil. Right. No, no, no. To yes. lust for her, right? So the lust itself is evil. And who is he lusting at? Yeah, your neighbor's you, wife. Fine. I'll right, because you, you cannot well, covet wait, something that me, cannot belong on, to this, you. This isn't Q and A. This is you. You responded, right? So, but so this verse is expressing an evil desire, and therefore it is always evil to have an evil desire, and that's what the text. Now, the the text may be speaking of an evil desire of having your neighbor's wife. That could be true, but the evil desire is always evil desire. There is a lust. So, so I um, mean, okay. maybe we can debate next about porn because if I'm understanding yep. correctly, that's you all can correct. correct me because then then pornography is not sinful. If, if what you're saying is true, if I'm understanding you correctly, and I don't want to misrepresent you, then there's nothing wrong with pornography. Well, here's here, here no, the question. You know, the, the, the response question that I would ask you, uh, Mike, I would ask you, when you were dating your wife, were you attracted to her? Did you desire her enough to pursue her? The word isn't attraction. The word isn't and desire. The word isn't lost. pursue. The word is evil. I did not. Well, if I listen, if I did <laughs> in any of those, let me let me no, let me rephrase that. Be you can talk if, to me like a man. I'm, I'm answering the question. If I <laughs> if I ever desired her lustfully, I just confess you did. No, then you yes, that. I was in sin if I did that. No, yes. you were not. If she was an available woman, it is uh, not. So porn is fine as long as the women. Rob, you got to take over. You got to take over. We got to go. Okay, let's let's go to the next question. Super chat. We got please. Explained Second Samuel twelve eight and Isaiah four one. Does anybody know those? Gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care. I also gave oh, you the okay. house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I've gave you more things like these. It's in his rebuke of David um, for yeah. committing actual adultery. That's a great one. That's, that's a great one. So yeah. why would why would David why would God have said to David through the prophet Nathan, "I gave you your wives, and I would have given you more if you just asked." All right. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, okay. this is in the context of right after. Uh, Yep. Yeah, a little black. Can you. I answer this, Mike? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, this is in the context of right after uh, David David uh, takes uh, uh, takes Uriah's wife, and then God is God is saying basically, I gave you everything, and you have it, and and to take uh, even beyond all that I all that I given you. And in that, and so there's nothing really controversial except in that list of the things that I delivered from uh, from Saul. He says, I gave you your master's house, your master's wives, into your keeping, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If that had been too little, I would have given you even uh, even much more. And and so you can see why, and it's not totally unreasonable. I'll be honest. Why, why someone could say, well, he's saying, you know, if you had wanted more wives, I would have, I've given you more, but even that doesn't really make sense. Uh, all of the, all of Saul's wife had been delivered over to him. So what is he saying? I would have uh, sovereignly gone back in time and made Saul have more wives. So I could give you more women from Saul's that, that really is not the point. He's saying that if all that I had given you was, was too little, I would have given even more. But the point is, I didn't give you too little. Now, the question is, though, about what is this giving of the, the master's wives? Um, first off, we have no indication that uh, that David had sex with any of or, or married any of the, the wives of Saul. There, there's actually no there was actually no indication of that. Um, rather, what I think what it's saying is that these wives were put under the keeping and the safeguarding of David to dispose of them as he pleased. And we see in the Old Testament that these wives had to be uh, protected and guarded in, in many ways because whoever took those wives would often have a, a claim for the throne. And we see that same controversy playing throughout the whole Bible. So really all this is saying is that uh, Saul's wives were put under the care of David as a result of the conquering mm -hmm. of, of Saul's kingdom. It does not okay. say that God had given these wives for these well, these women, these women of Saul, for David so, to marry them, have sex with them. I, so I, the I would context, add one thing. In, I, in the context yeah. of him being chastised for taking another man's wife, you're saying that God said, well, I would have given you some more of women that wouldn't wouldn't be in your care. <laughs> the main you point know. is in the women. The but the, the context, okay, but everything. the context is, the context of the rebuke is, you took another man's wife, and the answer to it is, if, if, 
I gave you all of these things. I gave you a bunch of wives already. If why did you have to take another man's wife? If if had if that had been too little, I would have given you more of these things. Why did you take another man's wife no. when I would have given no. you more if that's what you wanted? I, I think if that statement, I think that statement I had given you, the master's wife was taken out. The, the statement would make complete sense. Still, the point is that you should have been fully content with all that God had given you because He had delivered the kingdom and and and, and satisfied all your desires, and yet you continue to covet after things that that you, you thought you didn't have when you had everything. The, the point about the wives is just part of that whole list of what happened when the throne was transferred over to David. And I don't think the giving over the wives have to do with him having sex with them, but rather him so uh, having offered care of them. David into deeper sin. That's what you're saying is God offered. No, I don't him think he had sex with them. No, I don't think well, he had sex with them. And I don't think if he did, well, I don't think he should have. But, you, but, but to I be think, fair, you don't, have is, any, you don't have any text to support that. The point just, is the context just, was, David took another man's wife, had sex with her. And he's like, I already gave you these wives to have sex with. If you're just saying that he gave yeah. another man's wife to take care of, that doesn't make sense because that's just responsibility with no, no, no reward. No, no, he says right here in the very beginning. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house. And see, it's not. Oh, I gave you all these women to have sex with. That, that's not the point. The point exactly. is that I have made you king. I have given you everything. And yet, and part of that being king, everyone who is king, the women are going to come with it. What you're supposed to do with those women is something entirely different. I'm saying you're not supposed to have sex with the women. But I think you're changing the context to, David, I gave all of these women to have sex with, and yet you continue to want to have sex with other women. That is not the point of the text. Well, that's so. So the, 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 the very next include. line it says, the very next line it says, "Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in His sight?" And then he goes on to, to to explain what's evil in His sight. And yet David had many wives prior to God giving him Saul's. So even if we dis, even if we agree with you that he didn't have sex with Saul's wives, he still had a bunch more prior to that. And God never tells him anywhere that it's evil in His sight. All right, guys, let's let's go and start work shutting it down. It's uh, it's pushing quarter to 12 uh we're gonna go ahead and give each side a chance to do closing statements somebody said they dropped two super chats in here and they disappeared it was uh it was uh pastor or, or uh, yeah pastor rufus okay um, pastor rufus if you have those copy and paste them real yes. quick and we can we can go ahead and ask them because if, if you 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 know paid i don't want to overlook you but i didn't see them um oh wait hold on let's see wise uh let's see if there's anything and if, if not we'll just start to shut it down who was it Pastor Rufus, I think he's a straight with straightway. Straightway, yes. Okay. I don't see anything. I don't know if Pastor Rufus, if you're still here. Yes, we never did. We yes, never Isaiah four one. Somebody just said Isaiah four one. That's what he asked. Somebody please okay. explain Isaiah four one. Yeah, I, I had a question about that that I wanted to ask of the group or a quick answer too. Um, how is it possible for seven women, seven women, to marry one man and it for to for it to take away their reproach? If it's yeah. sinful, if it's adultery, if it's if it's all these bad things and it's it's bad fruit, how does it take away their reproach? Mm, amen. Yeah. So, Mike, do you want to answer this one? You, I'm on right there. Pulling up the passes. Go right ahead. Yeah. So what, what's going on here in Isaiah is it's what's being described here is that there's going to be this great time of of tribulation and, and all these things where all the men are going to die and it's going to be uh, just just horrible uh, reality that's going to happen upon Israel and and to describe that figuratively describe this and this is a figurative description of of how bad it it's like when it says uh, and sometimes it actually literally happens uh, that it'll it'll be so. Uh, there'll be so little food that you know a donkey's head will be sell, sell for a million dollars and stuff like that, or that women will eat their child. And so the conditions are so bad here uh, that there's so little men that there's only one man, and that these seven women are described as taking on this one man so that they can be no longer reproached as being single and and, and, and you know destitute and prostituting mm -hmm. themselves and and all this other stuff. But but again, th this is a description of the great desolation and desperation of the people in that day. And so, yeah, the, the, the people often would view the prostituting woman, the, the, the woman being out there raped and all this as, as a reproachful person. And so she's figuratively being described as attaching herself to, to one man. But, but the fact that this is here does not tell us that this is what ought to happen. Any more than when it says right. that women will eat their children, is it telling us that under starving situations should women eat their children? It's really just a description of, of, of what those conditions will be that would make this even um, 
uh, conceivable in that day. Yeah. And I'm just going to add that again, it's a, it's a metaphorical expression, metaphorical mm -hmm. expression that depicts a hypothetical future during times of distress and scarcity. That's the point of the text as JD articulated. And I won't, I won't go any further. So, so if we read it, let, let's actually read what it says and we'll see how much metaphor is here. Seven women will take hold of one man in that day saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. In that day, the branch of Yahweh will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth will be the pride of yet adornment of the survivors of Israel. It will come about that he is left in Zion, remains so on and so forth. And it talks when Yahweh has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed, etc., um, no, this is an example of future polygyny and the taking away of reproach is always tied to bringing offspring. All right. I think we're, I think we can go ahead and start to shut it down. We're going to do the closing arguments, uh, each side will give you five minutes. Who wants to take it for JD and pastor Mike? Who wants to do this? Go ahead, JD. You've been on a roll. I'll let you, I'll let you flow through. <laughs> All right. Let me put my timer on. Yeah. So uh, our, my argument is essentially remains the same. I think that when we search the scriptures and not with this legalistic framework of, well, it technically doesn't say, well, it technically doesn't say you can't do drugs. It technically doesn't say that you can't, uh, you can't have gay marriage. It technically doesn't say a whole bunch of things that you uh, can't, uh, have abortion, all kinds of other things like that. It's not about, technically it doesn't say, it's about what does God reveal about marriage? What does God reveal about the law of love? And what does God reveal all throughout his scriptures? And what we find is that God, when he revealed what marriage is, when he institutes marriage in Genesis 2, it's between one man and one woman, and it's supposed to be lifelong. It's not supposed to be between two men, not supposed to be between two women. It's not supposed to be two transsexuals. It's not supposed to be between man and six other women. It's not supposed to be that way. It's one man, one woman, life commitment of faithful fridelity, and not supposed to uh, even include uh, divorce or anything else. And yet, throughout the Bible, unfortunately, man has corrupted what God has created. And that corruption looks like from the very beginning, people started going beyond God's instruction. The very first case of polygamy is that rotten fruit of that rotten, evil, godless man who's a, who's a mass murderer taking on multiple women. And unfortunately, unfortunately, because God did not strike him dead at that moment or because God didn't shout from on high that this was wrong. Unfortunately, godly men in the Old Testament took up this practice. And yet God was instructing and teaching his people by way of their bad example and the death and destruction and misery that it brought. My opponents could not give you one example of a, a polygamous marriage that resulted in happiness and life and prosperity. And the sad thing is, these men think that they themselves are going to produce uh, those good marriages that they have never seen in the Bible. And what was going to happen is they're going to hurt and destroy women and family. God created the two to come and become one flesh with one another to produce a godly offspring. And they're not going to produce that. They're going to produce, like I said, death, misery, and it, they're just going to be a parable. And then we're going to see once again, why we should follow what God says and what God's truth is. We see that even in the old Testament, but then in the new Testament, we have so much more clarity and Jesus, my opponents kept asking me, where can we find that polygamy is, is outlawed or polygamy is, is wrong. And I would say it's right there in the commandment. Thou shall not commit adultery. When you realize what the central reality of that commandment is, namely that sexuality is supposed to be within the covenant of marriage and sexuality outside of that to include pornography and everything else, including polygamy is wrong. And we see that that principle brought by Jesus himself in Matthew and when he goes all the way back to the beginning and says this is where it was and this is how it should be the fact is my opponents don't like that Jesus says things even though it's in the context of divorce that applies through marriage universally it does and guess what if my opponents were arguing gay marriage they would use that verse 
because that verse teaches us what true marriage is supposed to be looking like, which is that one woman, one man. The text says, if someone marries while they are still married, to have sex with that person is to commit adultery. And that's my position, that it is, it is in fact, to commit adultery now with this full of revelation. To do that is a sin, is a violation. It should not be done. This is why when God gives uh, what a model Christian is supposed to look like, which is supposed to be an elder, which is supposed to be a deacon, he says that they are to be a husband of one wife. Unfortunately, through the debate we never got to ask our opponent why it is that god tells leaders of the church that they must be the husband of one wife but their position simply makes no sense unfortunately what they rely on is these old testament uh, realities of broken marriages to try to justify their own lust i mean i, I hate to say it but it sounded like my opponents actually don't even think pornography is, is sinful i mean that that's what the position is about people say that i'm so, uh, That's nope. about sex. I'm not. Sex nope. is a beautiful thing. It's created in marriage and it should be honored in marriage. Last point I, I was trying to say position is that really a question of which position loves each other and uh, would not be to, um, to do polygamy. Okay. And is that it? Am I done with the five minutes? No, no, you got, you got something? about 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you, were cut, you were uh, cutting so out for a second. Should, we we should love. No, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we should, we should love our wives. We, we don't love our wives by having sex with other people. We don't love our wives by cheating on them. We don't love our wives by bringing a, a, a new woman in. Last point, which is what Mike himself brought out in the opening statement, is that we see uh, what marriage is supposed to look like through the picture of Christ and the church. And we have one Christ husband with one bride. That is the picture of marriage, and that's what marriage is supposed to reflect, and, and that's what monogamy does. So for all those reasons, I think uh, monogamy is the overwhelming position of the Christian church and the church has been right uh, all along tell us thank you P appreciate that um how do you guys want to do it do you want to we're good wanna... we're gonna split i'm gonna lead off okay all right you want to start it go ahead i will so uh this evening one of the things we've seen is that our two uh opponents here believe that abraham jacob moses gideon david joash solomon all lived in gross sexual sin their entire lives, and uh, God said nothing. He didn't have the stones to stand up to them and tell them, guys, this is not good. This is a no-go. Instead, what they do is they say, oh, well, God kind of overlooked it, or it wasn't something that he was really going to be that paying that much attention to, but yet they have the audacity to call it adultery, serial or or perpetual adultery, I think they said. And yet we go to Hebrews chapter 11. It says, these are men approved by the most high. We see that God describes himself in these very terms. We see that Yeshua describes himself in these very terms. And we see over and over and over that this is God's means of taking care of women. It's his means of uh, growing a nation and there's not a single place in scripture, nowhere, ever. It's not there. You won't find it. It's not there that says that a man cannot have more than one wife. Instead, what these men do is they create out of thin air um, a definition for adultery. I challenge them to go back 300 years or even 500 years and take a look at what the definition of adultery was in any um, any theological literature. And what you will find is that it always, even as recent as the 15 and 1600s, is when a woman who is married breaks wedlock. It is not when a man breaks, or, or not, not when a man is joined to an additional woman. So I'm going to leave it there and pass it to my partner. Okay, Bible marriage, you got three minutes. So what we, what we didn't hear throughout this whole debate was either of these men Tell us exactly where we could find it is a sin. So, so we still haven't gotten a, a single law, a single place in scripture that definitively and explicitly defines taking another wife as a sin. They, however, want us to believe that it's adultery because they've interpreted it and they've inferred adultery from passages about divorce, not passages about keeping your wives, but passages about divorcing your wives. They want us to believe that 
while we read, God says, I do not change. They want us to believe that while he says, I, uh, it is an abomination to have unequal weights and balances, to have different differing standards of, of, of measure. They want us to believe that what was righteous for Abraham is no longer righteous today. What was unrighteous for Abraham is no longer righteous today. So they, they, they want us to believe that God does change. They want us to believe that he does have differing standards of righteousness, that he would overlook all of this gross sexual immorality of Abraham, of Jacob, of all these men that are held up as the standards. They want us to believe that that we just needed to wait until Jesus revealed it to us, that it actually was sin and it actually was a- adultery. So you, you've, you, God had to send his son to die to deal with sin. But you guys want us to believe that Jesus never just explicitly said this sin, this one. I know I told you about all of these other ones that I wanted you to stop, but this sin, he was just going to just leave it up to inference. He was just going to leave it up to us reading between the lines and trying to figure it out. They talk about love. They talk about love your neighbor as yourself. They talk about loving women. But still, what you didn't hear from them is any single answer for all of the women, the Christian women who want a husband and will never be able to find one. Why? What did they say? You know what? Uh, Feminism's the problem, and maybe they should just learn to be single. That, hey, if that is your pastoral answer to your flock, that is your pastoral answer. It's not mine. I'm not a pastor. But if I was, I wouldn't want to be telling that to my flock. I don't think that is loving. I don't think that is the law of love as you have uh, uh, stated up front, JD. I think I think God's answer has always been that righteous men cover more women when there is a need, period. He's never said anything otherwise. Why should we believe that? That's good. All right. That's, uh, that's going to do it. Uh, we're going to let each guy tell you where you can find them online in case anybody wants to follow. Um, and go ahead and drop in the comments who do you think won the debate we'll go back through and see if we can get a consensus um i see a lot of comments on both sides and uh give give some hearts and some thumbs up for these guys for giving what three hours of their time to us tonight um but go ahead uh let's just go in the order that we started out pastor jd where where can people find you for those that might not have seen it in the beginning yeah, uh, you can go to Exploring Theology uh, on YouTube. Just search Exploring Theology with my name, J.D. Martin, and uh, you will find uh, tons of discussions very similar to this. Uh, I've done many, many debates uh, like this on, on this channel. Well, here's one on this channel, but many on my own channel and, and even some uh, various other channels all throughout the Internet. So uh, Exploring Theology, and then just put J.D. Martin put on YouTube, and, and, and then you should be able to find it. Great. Pastor Mike? Uh, yes, sir. You can find me at Elder Mike, your urban church. Again, that's Elder Mike, your urban church. Same with JD. Done several debates. I've debated the false uh, cultic group of the Hebrew Israelites, uh, many of the generals in that group. Um, and so you can find a lot of content, a lot of debates, and things like that. So, God Great. bless. Uh, Pete Rambo. Um, you can find me on YouTube. Got a channel that uh, at uh, Peter G Rambo, and uh, that is a channel used for polygyny as well as uh, headship and patriarchy. A lot of good stuff. Also, my blog Natsav N A T S A B dot com. Got a great section that has lots and lots of support material, books, other downloadables, uh, videos, um, and then I've got two papers. Uh, Paul's perspective on polygyny and Jesus's perspective on polygyny, both at academia.edu, worth downloading and reading and putting pieces together, bring some historical context to the conversation as well. Okay, Bible marriages. You can find me on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter on uh, all of them, I believe, is at Bible marriages. And pretty much everything I'm doing is breaking down this topic and everything surrounding biblical marriage. Uh, Instagram has the majority of my information and posts. Uh, Twitter's more threads, as you know, uh, and I'm just starting on Twitter. But uh, my Instagram is a good place to start. I've got a lot of posts that that kind of break apart all of these things that we talked about tonight in detail. Um, and this is something that I, I feel definitely called by the Father to do and enjoyed. I really enjoyed the debate tonight, guys. Um, honestly, I hope we can do it again. I hope we can keep talking about this um, and uh, keep flushing it out. And, and uh, yeah, I loved it. Awesome. Awesome. My name is Rob B. Kowalski. You can find me on all the platforms at Rob B. Kowalski. And um, 
yeah, we'll probably do this again. Again, I hope you all see that I uh, we went out and we found the best. You know, we found the best on both sides. I think they were both very well studied and made some great points. So, uh, yeah, just drop in the comments and let us know if, if we changed any of y'all's minds. Uh, I see a lot of people commenting for, for both sides. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll try to do this again. Uh, Pete or Bible Marriages, if you guys want to hang out, maybe we do like a little post-debate uh, interview. If, or if one of you want to hang out, we could do that kind of like they do after the presidential debates and <laughs> get your thoughts on how you think it went and like what do you wish you said or missed or and we could do that for your for you guys too jd and mike if you want come back in in a couple minutes you want to do that i'm going, I'm going to bed bro okay <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I, I got a wife your son's like come on dad <laughs> that's right all right yeah, we really, really appreciate your time thank you so much I for doing it. this okay we'll stay in touch thank you all right god bless thank okay, you have a bye Oh, man. All right. Cool. How'd you guys think it went? Is the it's you're still live? Oh yeah, that's okay. I wanted to do a little post debate. Oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Yeah, like what do you? How do you think it went? What do you wish we we talked about, or or you know, what do you think they kind of really took off off uh, topic? They don't understand adultery. They do not understand. They they he pulls the definition of adultery out of thin air using the you know just what modern culture defines adultery as, and that's it. It simply does not comport with what is in scripture. Yeah, that, that's his number yeah. one place, and they can't produce a scripture. They can't produce a particular place that says that that a single example of God saying don't do that. Yeah, it's not there. Uh, early, early into this, Rob, what I what I found in my study, like the study of adultery, is what led to the study of all of this. And and I've said it before that it's really the um, I forget the word. I always forget when I try to use it, but it is the key. It is the key to understanding all of this. If you get adultery wrong, everything else is wrong. You can't you cannot see anything that we're trying to talk about when you don't understand adultery. But the moment that you realize what it actually is, everything falls into place, and that's why. In JD's perspective, while there was a lot of things we agreed on, um, I, I totally agree that feminism is a huge problem in the church. Yeah. What, what I hope that that JD and others will see is that the monogamy only, the false monogamy only doctrine of that actually props up feminism in the church. That that is a thing that that teaches um, women to not look at marriage properly. Right. So, mm -hmm. so there's this side by side view of marriage that gets taught where it's actually more of a top down uh, authority. That's actually what scripture teaches. And so so the devil and the enemy wants women to believe either they are side by side and equal or even worse. They want it to be in, they want it to be inverse. They want to be the head. Right. Right. Um, so polygyny and biblical biblical polygyny actually immediately destroys feminism in the church because you immediately don't have um, equality between the sexes, right? right? There is no equality in the sexes with polygyny because the man is the head, right? right? If the man can take more than one, he's not by, by the nature of that, the same as the woman. Right. Um, and I do truly believe that's why the enemy fights so hard to protect this monogamy only doctrine um, yeah. because of all the other things that the, that the falsehoods that it brings um, allows to happen within within the church and within the body. Mm, it's really good. One of the things that frustrates me is when they do the whole love your neighbor as you love yourself. Like you know, how would your wife feel? And I'm like, what? It, what if just loving your neighbor is love? You love yourself is marrying that widow across the street with three kids. Like, yeah, exactly. not because you want to have sex with her necessarily. Yeah, but I, 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 actually, James would be would say exactly the opposite, that you are sinning if you don't step up and take care of her and you have the ability to do so. Right. That's sin. Yeah. James yeah. chapter 2, verses 14 through 16 or something like that, right in there. Um, yeah, they, they, they definitely, as do most of these, they definitely relied a lot on emotion. What does... Mm -hmm. And, and so a lot of their argument was trying to draw out these these difficult emotions and whatever to to win it by an emotional argument. Um, you got to go to the facts. You got to go to scripture. And they couldn't produce the scripture. Yeah. Well, yeah. And his his entire argument about Matthew nineteen um, and and why he gets adultery out of that I, after studying that passage, I just think he and a lot of people actually get that wrong. That the adultery that's being talked about there, um, it has nothing to do with the second marriage. Yeah. Um, it, 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 what Jesus is saying is if you divorce your wife in order to marry another, 
the reason, the, the only reason we know about the second marriage is because he's telling him that was the reason, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's like if you divorce, he's saying, is, can we divorce our wives for any reason at all? And Jesus is saying, no, there's only one reason. Torah says there's only one reason, right? Sexual immorality. So if your reason is to, to marry another, you're committing a form of adultery, right? Uh, it gets a little bit deeper and more nuanced than that when you start breaking down what's actually going on there. But the point is you can't draw adultery as a second or third wife from a passage about divorce. Like even if we accepted his interpretation of where the adultery is, the first marriage or the second, he thinks it's as, as a result of the second. We're not talking about leaving a wife. We're talking about keeping two of them, right? So he's just, he's, um, he's, he's inferring a lot and he's, he's adding to the text and he's just, they're, they're all flat out ignoring so much of tech, so much of the Torah, so much of the text. Um, and, and it's all based on an appeal to emotion really. And you saw that a lot. Um, it's, it's again, like Pete said that you don't understand adultery. You can't understand any of this stuff. And, and there's a big reason for a people to continue to believe adultery is what they believe it is. Right. Because, uh, there's so much of our current relationship culture in marriage in the church that is feminist inspired equality, right? The, and then they were saying it, the man owns the woman and the woman owns the man. It's, it's, it's all the same. You can't, your eyes belong to me, says the woman, right? right? Your eyes belong to me. You can't even look at another woman. Okay. But the scripture doesn't say that they would argue that it does, but, um, the idea of him cheating on his wife, right? That's a mm -hmm. modern idea. That's not that's not what the, the Bible describes. The Bible doesn't say that Jacob was cheating on Leah with Rachel. No, uh, it doesn't say that at all, right? It never describes that. It calls um, her his wife, his right. woman. And, and, and so the, the idea of cheating, the idea of adultery as they see it is a very modern definition of adultery. Um, and in fact, the vast majority of Christianity didn't define it that way for, for a long period of time. That's a relatively new um, modern version of adultery, uh, which didn't really get flushed out in this debate. One, yeah. one of the things that, uh, you know, they said basically was, or that you just mentioned was that, you know, uh, th this destroys feminism. And something that is interesting is 75% of the divorces that are being filed right now are being filed by the women. And I feel like that's because of this equality thing, because it makes them equal in the relationship. And then they somehow the women lose interest because they know that the man, you know, that even if the man never practices pol polygyny, just the fact that he has the biblical right to and he knows it, that subjugates her and pushes her into her feminine, which is a good thing because it creates polarity yeah. in the Sim relationship. Yeah, sim simply putting it on the table. Yeah. Um, but, but I would also say that biblically, there's no option for a woman to initiate a divorce. It's yeah. not right. And, and furthermore, you know, the, the idea of even jealousy, right? You, you can't you can't righteously be jealous about something um, that you don't have the right to be jealous over. Uh, in Numbers 5, we see that a man could submit his wife to a jealousy test if he thinks she's been unfaithful. But there's no ability for the woman to do that for the man. Right. Right. So because jealous. because a man, you can be righteously jealous over something that belongs to you exclusively. Right. right? You, mm -hmm. you cannot be jealous yeah. over something that does not belong to you. That's a great and, point. And Even bio biology tells us this, because if you look at women that have the more the most sex partners, 10 or more, they have the highest divorce rates. It's not that same with men. Promiscuity doesn't affect men the same way it affects women. Why? Because of polygyny, because God knows a man can take multiple wives. He can have sex with them all and he's not going to be affected. But a woman's supposed to have one husband. Mm -hmm. And biology tells us that women are yeah. exponentially yeah. more negatively affected by promiscuity. Right. And the other thing, they, they didn't really give us, you know, the, the fact that I thought I really disagreed with was one of the things he said, well, most women can get married if they want to. I'm like, what world do you live in? The marriage rates are the lowest they've ever been in history right now. Five out of every 1,000 people are getting married yeah. per year. I'd love where, to have what he was smoking right there. <laughs> where, you know, where are these guys that are marrying these women? Because uh, the, yeah. the numbers don't support that at all. No. Anyway. All right. I mean, well, Pastor, I, did you all want to say anything before we, you jump off? You good? No, I'm good. Appreciate it. No, this was awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring in Pastor Mike. He's he's still streaming on his channel, apparently, and I'm going to give right. him a chance to, to speak. Appreciate you yeah, guys. For sure. All right. All right. Talk to you soon. Love Thanks, you, bro. Guys. God bless. Nice. See you, Pete. See you, Bible marriages.
All right. Hey, sir. Uh, hey, Pastor Mike. Yeah, and I'm not going to stay on long. I just jumped out. I, I realize I'm like, man, I'm multi streaming in here. You know what I mean? I'm not even a part of it. <laughs> How'd you think it went? Uh, like, pardon? How'd you think it went? Uh, I think it went it went well uh, for the most part. You know what I'm saying? It, as any debate, uh, you know, it went well. Uh, what, go ahead. what do they say? Was there anything that they said that you really disagreed with or maybe yeah, something you wish yeah, you could have said? Uh, pretty much when it uh, they were basically approving lust, mm. uh, lust, lust, evil lust uh, as acceptable so long as it's not with, upon a married woman. Uh, mm. I, they never responded. I was hoping they clarified their position on um, pornography <laughs> but it, it was scary that they didn't mm. so it makes me think and again i don't want to impose on them or neither do i want to accuse them but i think that people can go away with the impression that there's nothing wrong with pornography mm. and i think that uh, even statistics show the damaging uh crazy uh effects of pornography upon our society uh even medically how it uh what it does to a man mentally and so and that so that that part was 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 extremely scary uh for me um but you know of course we disagree i'm not here to to re try to debate uh, people you know will will listen prayerfully will consider the scriptures uh i do know two you know points that you know a couple points we didn't bring out in the debate but again and what jd kind of alluded to it in that you know throughout church history when the church got this right you all and this isn't a uh, he said commentaries may have defined adultery in a certain way uh, you know, in the fifth century, but we can go all the way back to Tertullian. We can go back to uh, several of the earliest church fathers, uh, Irenaeus, uh, who are clearly, clearly and explicitly in their teachings, uh, supporters of the monogamous marital relationship. Uh, and these these are men who were deci either disciples and or disciples of the disciples of the apostles. They got this right. The church got this right. God is sovereign. Uh, it's a reason why the the vast minority of people who claim to be Christian hold to polygyny. The reason is because the church got this right and God in his sovereignty and JD, I think communicated this beautifully, uh, God in his sovereignty, uh, throughout scripture. And we, we all hold to, uh, types of progressive revelation. Um, you know, uh, and, and there were things that in the old Testament that were permitted, but that, that permitting, uh, in no way, uh, vindicates the sin nor uh, means that it was God's sovereign purpose. Uh, and, and, you know, God's sovereign purpose was for Adam not to sin at all. Yeah. Right. But Adam sin, right. Yet God had a plan to bring. And, and guess what? He didn't fulfill that plan to send his only begotten son until several uh, millennia, couple, well, at least a, a, a couple, a few, well, quite a few millennia later, millennia later, several centuries later, Christ comes. So, so it isn't that God was approving the sinful acts of men. For all those time before Christ came, no, there was a system in place. The law, the law was temporary itself. The whole Mosaic law that they've referenced over and over and over was temporary to Christ. It all pointed to Christ. And so ultimately the law itself was a regulating of sinful acts and the means by which mankind can maintain a relationship with, with God uh, until Christ would come. They look forward to the cross. We look back at the cross, but ultimately uh, we meet at the cross and we find our clarification of all things in Christ. And mm -hmm. I, I, and of course, you know, we went to our verses, Matthew 19, where Jesus took us right back to the beginning. Paul takes us right back to the beginning. Uh, Genesis chapter number two is clear. God did not bring Adam. Uh, if, if anybody need multiple wives, needed multiple wives to replenish mm -hmm. the earth, you would think Adam did, right? right. Like you would have read Eve, Yvette, Eveline, <laughs> Eveline, and all, all her sisters, right? So, so they all could have been pregnant at the same time. No, God brought one woman to Adam. Uh, you know, this is something I thought of because, you know, people say that God allowed polygyny in, in the Old Testament because of wars and he wanted to populate the earth. With all these theories people have that I, I didn't I've never seen in the Bible, but yeah. I think yeah. do think it's possible, he, you know, that, that he allowed it for whatever reason. And then he allowed monogamy and it served its purpose for a period of time. But my question is now, since the sexual revolution, right, because now you have all these women that are in the streets and most women are having sex before marriage, even in the church. And I've lived this world. I wrote a book about this called Why Waiting Works, How Fast Sex Prevents Us From Finding Love. So this has been my world for the last five years. The majority of Christian women are sexually active, S singles. Um, I don't know what the percentages are. I don't have that. Um, mm -hmm. But 
my thought is, is like, you know, I heard Andrew Tate say something on a podcast and he's like, monogamy isn't the issue. He said, he says it, the challenge is for men to find a woman to be monogamous. That's worthy to be monogamous too, is the language that he used. And I do see that because since the sexual revolution, men don't have to get married anymore to have sex. And they, the women have already been having sex outside of marriage. So now you're going to try to convince them they have to buy it when they've already been giving it away to other people. That's going to be a tough sell. So is it possible that God, just like he allowed polygyny in the Old Testament because it served a purpose, maybe he allowed monogamy for you know the last 2,000 years, and now it's it's not working anymore because the marriage rates are so low, and men just aren't doing it anymore. My question is, how are we going to make marriage more attractive to men? Because right there, for some reason, they're not finding it attractive because they're not doing it anymore. or And not just marriage. How are we going to make obedience to God a, more attractive to men? Because right now, they're fornicating. The least the ones that can are. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that well, might not be a question you have an answer to. It's just a thought. I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to uh, kind of go back just to make it clear that God never approved polygyny. <laughs> he never approved it. Just because something is seen and regulated in the text doesn't mean God's stamp of approval. When I say stamp of approval, in other words, is that he was pleased by it. Right. He never commanded polygamy, nor did. And I would disagree with I know we've had to debate with the cert, certain interpretations of certain texts. But but he never it was never God's will nor purpose for a man to have multiple wives. And that was not God's creative purposes from the beginning. So so I don't make the argument that, well, he did. It, it was good for a while, but it's no longer good. No, it was never good. Uh, but to answer the second part of your questions, you know, we live in a sin cursed world. And I'm going to tell you, <laughs> isn't it amazing that that although Solomon was permitted to marry as many wives as he wanted, still lusted and still got in trouble with women. So the answer to man's sin problem of lust is not multiple wives. Sure. Sure. Marriage will look a lot more attractive to a man if you <laughs> tell him he can have more wives. The, 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 there's a part of my fallen nature not, that would love that. You, if you understand what I'm saying. I don't <laughs> agree that it's lust, though. That's what people accuse well, me of. I've been abstinent for 18 of the last 23 years. Everybody that's in my comment accusing me of lust. I've been abstinent far longer than them. They went out and got married within a year or two. And it's like they well, didn't. Abstain. I so I and it's not it's not what it is. It's it's. I don't even know that most men would practice it, but for me, what it would have done before is instead of a man waiting for this one magical unicorn to come along, it would just be a pragmatic decision. It would be like, I met girls that were good girls. I would have been like, you know what? She's a good girl. She's adding value to my life. I'm adding value. Let's get married. If I decide I want a second down the road, I could take one, whatever. God's cool with it. I would have got married and that would have been good for me. It would have been good for them because I've seen their lives since they went out and dated a bunch of non-Christians and slept with them and whatever. And like, at least I would have led them closer to God. I don't know if I would have even taken a second, but knowing that I could have, because I, for whatever reason, men get scared before marriage. I'm sure you're, you're a pastor. You see guys freaking out before they get married because there's one and only till death do us part forsaking yeah. all others. I don't see that in the Bible. And I think it freaks men out and it, they may never the likelihood is most would never actually do it but knowing that they could would make them get married i'd get married at 18 years old i would have been married probably you know know who else it freaks out women <laughs> now nah, nah, like women they would they dream of getting married men yeah, dream of that, losing their virginity because i agree with you but it still freaks women out as well i mean women women especially in today's society they they enjoy sex just as much as me if not more in many cases and so you know <laughs> they can so. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know. Men have a lot of women I can call it a big different with you. No, I know I'm, they like I know they like sex, but not as much well, as men. All, you know? uh, well, all I'm saying is that we the reason to uh take on more marriages, you use the example of there are certain women and you've seen how they lived after. That's a heart issue. And and I I contend that if the heart wasn't right with God, then marriage isn't gonna make it right with God. See, my relationship, covering. my relationship covering. with God has to be intact before marriage, right? Before it sure didn't work for Solomon. He still he still went a horn after women he shouldn't have went after, right? And got in trouble with God and had his heart turned. If 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 polygyny was the answer to man's lust 
in bad decisions. It, matter of fact, those women continue to serve those other guys. Why? Because they were wicked in the first place, their heart condition. So marriage doesn't make a person live right. Marriage will never make a person live right. And I encourage people, even as a pastor, that don't know you're, you're not getting married. Uh, uh, you're not getting married to deal with your sin problem. Don't get if if your relationship with God isn't right in the first place. Matter of fact, if the person's relationship with God isn't right, I wouldn't even encourage them to get married. Right. I encourage them to get your relationship right with God. Then we can talk about marriage. And so, you know, uh, again, I, and I know you, we differ in these things. I just think um, as a pastor, as a, a person who counsels marriages on a regular, um, I know that uh, the one man, one woman, one woman model is the successful model that I think God explicitly communicates in the book of Genesis. We would have no argument had God brought Adam more than one woman. <laughs> right. I can't. I don't think we can necessarily assume that the only that God brought Adam. One, he 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 put him in. So I saw somebody post this comment today. He said, he, "So what? You know, God put Adam in a deep sleep, took one of his ribs out. So that was a completely unique situation. There's probably multiple reasons that he didn't take more than one rib. Maybe I, you know, like we can't just assume it was, <laughs> was kind of monogamy. Cool. Because I I look at you know Moses who wrote wrote that law about you know he wrote genesis and he didn't even believe it he had more than one wife he had zipporah and then he had the ethiopian wife and they were real close i mean some people say Zip zipporah was dead i'm like it doesn't say she died and it was like only like a chapter later or something it talks about the ethiopian so the, it seems like he had at least two you and, know what's uh, amazing I i'm sorry i'm gonna cut you no off. it's okay it's okay no no I just don't, I, I, you know, if it was adultery, Moses would have had to been stoned under his own law that he wrote. I, I, I just don't see that if it, that's a serious sin. If it really was adultery, David would have had to been stoned. Right. Moses would have had to been stoned. I think progressive revelation plays a part in even in, as JD said, even if it's not, I personally view this as adultery, but even if it certainly falls into the area, I think without question of pornea, right. Uh, of, 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 lust ungodly evil fornication uh, uh un unlawful contact with a woman who who isn't your wife yo and the scripture is clear let your be satisfied with the wife singular of your youth and things like that um and so and so i think that part is is absolutely clear but you want to know what i what i find intriguing and and this is this is me making the same argument i mean i'm being clear here that this is here's an argument from silence on my part making the same argument that they're making though right that we don't have one example of a polygynous marriage or relationship in the New Testament. <laughs> not a one, not in under the new covenant, which we're all under. You don't have Paul going, well, we know Paul didn't marry at all, so that's a bad example. But we don't have Peter going home to his wives. We know he was married. We don't have uh any illustrations uh of any of the apostles, any, and, 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 and here's a question that we didn't ask that I, I regret not asking because uh, I know um, Pete mentioned that he was a pastor. I don't know if he's a current pastor or if no, he, he is. used to be a pastor. Used to be, yeah. But uh, how, how, and, and, and then we can, we can wrap it up with this because like I said, I'm, sure, I gotta go sure. to bed myself. Yes. But, <laughs> but how, how do you, and I, and I know you've talked with them and, and you probably share a similar position to them. How do you how do you answer the question about the bishop and or the elder? Do you at least agree that the text is explicit that for the bishop and the elder that they are only to have one wife? Well, I would say to that is first off, the fact that he even mentioned it must have meant that it that polygyny was at least prevalent, still prevalent, because he wouldn't have had to say it or right. I agree with that. Okay, so you say you said it wasn't in the New Testament. Like, why would he have pointed it out if it wasn't at least prevalent? Now, True. I've heard now people say that word "mia" in the Greek for one, you know, has a few different meanings. It also means first, like the believers gathered on the mia day of the week. So it doesn't mean one and only. It, it could mean one in a set or a first or a even a. So some people say husband of a wife, meaning he had to be married, or husband of first wife, like he couldn't have been divorced. But they even, I've heard people say, okay, fine. I'll concede that you're saying deacons have to be the husband of one wife if you concede that everybody else it doesn't apply to. 
Right. No, I could have said all believers must be the husband of one wife or all, all men, but it doesn't say that. And if all scriptures God breathe, deacons are a very small percentage of the church. Well, I think JD brought this point out in, in scripture makes this point very clear as, as Timothy was a was a bishop and Titus, who Paul said to ordain other elders in all, uh, other cities. But the scripture is clear that Timothy was to be an example of the believers. And so I think it's clear the other uh, the, the, he talked, told them not to be a lover of, of filthy lucre. He told them, you understand what I'm saying? So what does that tell me? Love and filthy lucre was prevalent. Doesn't mean it was approved by God. Doesn't mean it wasn't sinful. So I certainly agree with you that the reason he had to tell bishops to be the husband of one wife was because of the sinful practice of men having more than one wife. In the same way, he had to tell him to not be a lover of filthy lucre because that was a prevalent sin within the people in their day. And every other thing that he told him, you know, to take care of his home. Take and, and each of those other things, each of those other things, I think is explicitly clear that all believers should follow every well, last one of those other things i would say paul also advocated for being single because he said that marriage takes away from prayer time or whatever so it would only make sense that if there was a married man that he would have one and not two because so he'd have more time to devote to the church not necessarily that polygyny is a sin right because he does say it's better to stay single because you'd be more devoted to the lord so like that doesn't mean monogamy is sinful he, he's just like, it's better because you can have more time. So we're, we're automatically saying, no, it's because of the extra wife when I don't see any evidence for yeah, that. Now he did say that in a different passage. So, so I would, I would be on your side <laughs> if it was in that same passage and in that same context. You're smarter right. than me, man. I'm not going to, Oh no, 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 no. You I'm are, you are smarter than me. I, I, <laughs> no, I, I know. I appreciate, I, uh, no. I appreciate your your, your kindness. <laughs> no, you were great. This was I, this was amazing. Uh, Thank you for giving your time. Looks no like problem. Have a lot of people in here. I'll I'll make sure. Um, I'm going to cut this up and send everybody some clips from the debate to share, Sounds and good. and we'll stay in touch. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you all who watch. God bless you. All have a good evening. Thanks, Pastor Mike. Talk mm -hmm. to you later. Thank you, everybody.